right. <clears throat> Good morning. We're on the record. The record will show the presence of all counsel on the defendant. Uh, it's 830. The jury's ready, but I was told that counsel, I think it was defense counsel, wanted to raise a preliminary matter before the jury came in. Is that correct? Yes, Judge. We just wanted to make a quick record. Um, we had some discussions with the state yesterday regarding how to proceed with the witnesses since we're taking them out of order today. And we communicated to the state, and the state avowed to us essentially that they'll be able to lay foundation for the things that the expert that they are calling today will rely on. We are also taking a look at Rule 703, which states that the expert may base an opinion off of information that the expert has been made aware of or has personally observed himself. So we don't think that there's going to be a problem with this. We're accepting the state's avowal that they'll be able to lay the foundation. And the state has agreed to stipulate that if, for whatever reason in the future, the state is not able to lay that foundation, then we reserve our right to object based on foundation. Um, and we're doing that also for, for the court's efficiency, but also as part of trial strategy, so we don't have to have witnesses come on the stand for five minutes, come off the stand, and then get recalled later, as that might be disruptive to the jury. So we just wanted to make a record that that's, that's how we had communicated with the state to proceed today. Thank you. And that's correct, Your Honor. We appreciate the defense working with us on the scheduling to make it more efficient for today. So we appreciate that. All right. And, and let me just um, make sure I'm clear. First of all, I'm grateful that you're speaking to each other professionally like this and, and trying to resolve issues to make everything proceed more efficiently and expeditiously. But does that mean that there's a stipulation to the foundation? It doesn't mean that they don't have to call these witnesses, right? It just means that they're not going to... Correct. The it, it does not mean, let's say this We're deferring it, it mean, our objection on foundation until such time as I suppose they fail to lay it later with the proper witnesses. So, okay, so for right now, um, the agreement is that the state doesn't need to call these five-minute foundational witnesses to lay the foundation for the expert testimony that's anticipated today, but they will in the future at some point, and, and then if they're not able to, then you have that remedy that you can avail yourself of. Yes. Is that right? That's correct, Your Honor. So our experts are going to be talking about photos and about the scene and things that we don't need to lay the foundation for, but we will later subsequent to the testimony. So that's All right. Correct. And does that mean, I assume this witness has some demonstrative exhibits? I'm sorry. Does this witness have any exhibits that he's going to introduce? or? Well, he's got his report, and that's... I, we're, he's going to refer to his report, right, and that may be introduced or not introduced. We don't we see how the, the okay. testimony goes. And there's one other small little issue. There was a preclusion of the, like other ammo in this case, but the witness, the expert, used other ammo recovered at the scene to test fire the gun, which is similar to the ammo in the case. And so we just want the court to be aware he's going to be referring to other ammo used, and that's the other ammo. So. Thank you. I appreciate you bringing that up. All right. Uh, great. That's really good news. I appreciate it, counsel. Very well. There's nothing further than we can bring in the jury. We can have the wit is the witness here? Yes. Witness is in the backyard or right. outside. We can, have, we can bring the witness in. Thank you. Go ahead. Oh, all right, we're taking it. Well, hold on a second then. Oh, so we're taking this witness now. And what about, you were still cross-examining. Yes, we Sorry. were cross-examining Castaneda, and we're going to come back to him Perfect. later. Okay. All right, thank you. So just wait, just wait right there. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought you were somebody. It's going to be, a, and we'll get the jury in, and we'll bring you forward and have you sworn. No, he can, he can wait right there. You're fine. Can you explain a little bit of this to the jury, I assume, Judge? What do you want me to do? Oh. we're out of order. Yes. Okay, thank All you. All right. Okay, thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. All right, we'll just wait for the jury to come in, and then we'll ha bring you forward and have you sworn. And is your hand and fifth grade and learning to write about
rise לפי תופעות. Everyone, please be seated. The record will show the presence of all jurors, counsel, and the defendant. All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just talk to you for a second before we get started. Um, today, um, this gentleman here who's standing over here is going to be our first witness for today. I don't know anything about him or who he is. All I know is that he's come here from out of town, uh, flew in last night, I assume. And um, so we're going to try and get this gentleman on. He's, he's a witness for the state. He's going to take the stand now and provide his testimony. The gentleman was on the stand before. That was Deputy Castaneda. Is that right? And um, so in the interest of trying to make things move as efficiently as possible, we're going to take this witness out of order. Usually, we finish with that witness that's on the stand. Some other witnesses will testify, and we'll get to this gentleman in turn. But he's from out of town. We're going to take him out of turn. He's going to take the stand now, be subject to examination by both parties. And then we'll bring back Officer Castaneda so that we can finish his um, cross-examination. There are some other witnesses that um, provide foundational testimony for what this witness is going to testify to, but the parties have worked that out with the court. And those witnesses will still testify. But I want to make sure we get this gentleman on and off today, finish with Officer Castaneda, and that will allow us then to take some shorter witnesses. And you know, the goal really is to try to get us all out of here a little early today. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. All right? So thank you for your understanding. Any questions about that? Very well. All right, we're ready to proceed. Sir, if you would come forward now and be sworn by the clerk. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in the matter before the court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. Thank you, sir. If you'd come over here to the witness stand and have a seat. There you are. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Rick, can you, Mr. Wyant, can you um, state your name for the record and spell your last name? Yes. My name is Richard T. Wyant, W-Y-A-N-T. I go by Rick. May I call you Rick? You can. Rick, where are you, where are you, where are you from? I'm from Seattle, Washington. You flew in last night? I did. Let's talk about who you are. So walk the jury through a little bit about who you are, where your education is. Sure. I'm a forensic scientist in the area of firearm and tool mark examination and shooting incident reconstruction. I obtained my bachelor's degree in 1993 from Colorado State University and my master's in 1994 from Colorado State University in forensic anatomy. My bachelor's was in microbiology. And in 1995, I was hired by the Texas Department of Public Safety, the Texas Ranger Crime Lab to be trained as a criminalist in the area of firearm and tool mark examination. During those three years I was there, I was trained to do casework and also crime scene investigation. In 1998, I was hired by the Washington State Patrol Crime Laboratory in the Seattle area, and I've been there ever since. In 2008, I was promoted to supervisor, and in 2015, I started my own consulting firm doing the same type of work shooting incident reconstruction, ballistic comparisons, less lethal weapon examinations, and that's the role that I am in today. And how many years have you been in doing this kind of work as a forensic scientist? I hate to say it out loud, but it's 28 years I'm doing this type of work, and, and I'm also a member of several associations, published some papers, and presented at professional organizations. Let's walk through some of those. Um, you've worked at accredited state labs, correct? I still do. You still do. What's an accredited state lab? What does that mean? Well, accreditation is a governing body that oversees crime laboratories to ensure they're following proper protocols and procedures that are commonly used for forensic work. And part of that is chain of custody, analysis protocols, how we report, how we testify, 
And as part of that accreditation, we're inspected every five years. They go through our case files, make sure that we're taking proficiency tests, that we haven't gotten in trouble or said anything wrong on the stand. And then we're deemed to be accredited. And so my laboratory that I've worked at has been accredited ever since I started there. <coughs> and in your 28 <coughs> years, you obviously examined firearms. I have. How many would you say? Um, thousands. And in addition to my examination, I also teach at the ATF Academy, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Academy in Maryland, mm -hmm. where I train new firearms examiners. That's what I consider myself as a firearms examiner. And I've been doing that since 2005. So in terms of handling firearms, I, during that course, I handled probably 50 during that week, in addition to all the firearms that I've examined during casework. I'll come back to that. Let's talk about the other stuff you teach about and any other teaching or any other training you provide to other agencies? Um, yes, as part of my day job, I, of course, teach all of our law enforcement agencies in Washington, but I also travel and teach attorneys and law enforcement. I've taught regularly at the National SWAT Conference, NTOA, National Tactical Officers Association, where I train um, SWAT officers in less lethal weapons, like bean bags, things like that. <coughs> so I've done quite a bit of training in my career. It means a lot of travel for you? It is. Let's, talk, let's go back. So you examined, I think your words were, a thousand, over thousands of firearms. Between casework and training others, yes. We're talking about handguns? Handguns, revolvers, rifles, some automatic rifles, muzzle loaders, and then uh, less lethal launchers like 40 millimeter, and anything that can launch a projectile I've probably looked at in my career. Includes AR style weapons? Yes. AK style weapons? Yes. And you've also examined um, crime scenes. I have. And what do you do when you come to a crime scene? What's your goal? My goal is to establish a series of events based on the evidence that I looked at, of the objective collected evidence, to establish possible scenarios related to a shooting incident. There's a lot of methods and ways we do that. One is the physical examination of the evidence, and it's also documentation of the crime scene. And most recently, within the past five years or so, um, 3D laser scanning has been introduced to the crime scene realm. So I'm versed in that and I've done oh, probably 14 or 15 cases where I've utilized that technology to reconstruct a crime scene. And I don't, I'm gonna come back, but you also had reviewed a 3D scan in this case, right? I did. And you also do, I think you mentioned, shooting scene reconstruction? Yes. What, is, what does that mean? Well, like I just stated, it would be taking the evidence that's collected from the scene, photographs, occasionally witness statements, but typically I like to use the objective evidence that's collected. And so, for example, say I have a vehicle that has bullet holes in it. You can place trajectory rods into those holes, map out a possible bullet path, and then you can scan that car with the 3D laser scanner and then be able to determine possibly the origin of the shooter relative to the victim at the time that shot the, the shots occurred. So your shooting scene reconstruction, did you apply that skill set in this case? Yes. And how many shooting scene reconstructions do you think you've done in your 28 years? Well, every case that I analyze has an aspect of shooting reconstruction. So. Say I just get a bullet submitted to me and a firearm, but that bullet might have some defects or some characteristics on it that might lead to tell me where it came from or what it struck first. So that's technically considered a reconstruction, but the full reconstruction where I'm taking all the scene evidence, and I've probably done a couple of dozen over my career, not including what I did in Texas. And you also work for, I mean, you taught and trained for manufacturers of weapons, right? Yes. Like, give us some examples. Well, most, most of the training I do for manufacturers would be for less lethal um, applications, meaning a projectile that 
is intended to hurt you and not kill you. And I've helped develop a couple of those types of projectiles. You also taught, you teach yearly at the ATF, Firearms Academy? I do. And ATF stands for? Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. It's the federal regulatory agency for firearms. And they also host an academy that trains people that do what I do every year. And they bring in students from any local agency in the country, and they, they sponsor this academy. And I've been training at that academy for a week long. It's called Preliminary Examination of Firearms. It's essentially a cycle of fire. So from the time you take that cartridge out of the ammunition box until the bullet is downrange and the cartridge case is on the ground, what has happened to it? So the cycle of fire of that cartridge, and that's what I teach at ATF. You also teach things like operation of a weapon? Yes, the cycle of fire um, certainly is encompassed by the operation of the firearm, the types of firearms that are out there that we might see as a forensic scientist. And you also talk about the capabilities of specific firearms. What I mean by capabilities, distance, lethal, how lethal they are, and so forth, right? We have in-depth training on different types of projectiles and their behavior and flight and when they impact targets. Like, do you like shoot from a distance and measure and do all that stuff? How do you do that? We shoot intervening objects. We ricochet bullets off of objects, capture them in ballistic gelatin. We track bullets on Doppler radar to map incremental velocity, how fast is it slowing down as it travels downrange. I've done that for a couple of long-distance shooting cases that I've had. There's a question. The jury has a question, I think. Oh, you're raising your hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, Rick, um, this is probably the most obvious question. You don't work for the Santa Cruz County Attorney's Office, do you? I do not, and I'm not functioning as a role as a Washington State Patrol here either. This is my own private consulting firm that I'm working under today. You were requested to assist in the investigation in this case? Yes. Do you know what this case is about? Yes. What was it about? It was a shooting incident that occurred and where one person was shot and killed. And what were you called to do? What were you asked to do in this case? I was called to look at the crime scene and scan evidence and the ballistic evidence to determine if we could, or if I could, determine possible shooter locations and possible um, trajectory path of the bullet. And before we get into that, what was the weapon that you reviewed, that you looked at? I looked at an AK-47 pattern rifle. It was a semi-automatic version of the Russian AK-47, the most... I guess one of the most popular rifles in the world. And you also looked at what kind of projectile? Uh, the ammunition associated with those rifles is a 7.62 by 39 caliber cartridge, which is a military rifle cartridge. And you're familiar with this cartridge, right? I am. Have you ever testified about the distance that this cartridge can harm somebody? I have. I had a... a long distance shooting case with this type of rifle involved. How far of a distance was, was involved in that case? In this particular case, it was 796 yards, so about eight football fields or half a mile. And from that distance, this cartridge was fired and killed somebody? Yes. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to do a little, I'm going to ask you to put some gloves on. Your Honor, can I have Ienza, do you have Ienza help out? Can you grab the gun for us? And can you get... We're going to show you what's been admitted as Government Exhibit 101. To you, I think you refer to it as 21JA. Does that sound okay. familiar? It does. And as they're, getting, as they're getting the gun ready, you had, um, 
you came down to Arizona to, to do the analysis in this case, right? I did. Right. And walk us through, like, where'd you go and who'd you meet with? I went to a local shooting range. Uh, the sheriff's office met me there with the evidence. And I examined the rifle, test fired the rifle, and looked at the ammunition that was collected. And then, I mean, the, the rifle and stuff, was it, what condition was it when you first saw it? Oh, it was in a sealed condition with, I think, the box that you, you'll see here in a second. It was sealed by the sheriff's office. And then when I was done with my examination, I resealed it with my green evidence tape. Okay. And as detective is, is he performing the same task as you saw him do when you came down to Arizona? I couldn't see him, but probably. <laughs> <laughs> You use a pen. Oh, there's some scissors. Emma, permission to approach the witness, sir? You can just open the box right there. Leave it right there. Permission, Your Honor, for the witness to step down to review the exhibit. And go ahead, Rick. Put those gloves on. Oh, you did. You anticipated. Rick, I want you to take a look at what's in Government Exhibit 101. What do you see in there? Exhibit 101 was the rifle that I examined in this case. Do you recognize, like, the strap? Recognize certain features, the strap? Things like that about the rifle? Well, the main feature is the evidence tape that I placed on it during my exam. It has my initials and date on it. All right, I'm going to walk, you, walk us through how you measure operability and the functionality of the weapon when you review it. You can pick it up, can pick it up yeah. Permission, I'm sorry, permission. Thank you. Object to narrative, and I don't believe it's responsive to the question. You know, I asked him to, to explain overall, to the overall. So, as the trigger is pulled, the primer is struck, which we'll talk about, but it's the component of the cartridge that ignites the powder. And as the powder burns, it generates gas. That gas expands, creating pressure, and that pressure is what pushes the bullet. again, stripping a new cartridge off of the magazine into the chamber, and that process will happen as fast as you can pull the trigger. This is a semi-automatic, meaning for each trigger pull, one shot is fired. So if you held the trigger down on this particular rifle, it would fire one time. It's not a machine gun, but it is based off of a machine gun design. And how big of a magazine does that weapon hold? They're typically 30 round magazines. Is there a sighting on that weapon? There is. There's a, a rear sight here has a button that can be adjusted. And so again, this is a military type rifle, so occasionally you might want to do say to the fire to the range. So you can move this ladder sight and create different things with it in mind. And is there a rear sight? Which is a rear sight. Oh I'm sorry, I didn't wasn't 
tracking there. Sorry about that. And anything else about the weapon that's noteworthy for the jury? Uh, not necessarily. This is a pretty standard AK pattern rifle that I would expect to see in the laboratory. Does that look about the same condition that you had it when you tested it when you came to Arizona? It does. All these black straps that you see holding the action in place are the ones that I put there after I examined it. All right. You can put that back down. And you can go ahead and go back. And do you recall when you came to Arizona to test that gun? I do recall, yes. When was it? Oh, it was 7 7 of 23. So is that July 7th of last year? Yes. It's warmer here in July than in Seattle, right? It was uncomfortably warm when I was here. <laughs> you also looked at some ammunition, right? I did. And you used some ammunition, correct? I used ammunition in evidence for the test firing. And did you compare, so you use, there's two, two different sets of ammunition I'm gonna talk about. Well, I'm sorry, ammunition and there's some shell casings. Right, I want to keep these two things separate. Okay. Am I getting it right? I'm getting it right. Yes, so shell casings would be what's left after the bullet's gone down range, and typically the fired cartridge case is what we call it, would be um, around where the shooter was. So it's automatically extracted and ejected, like I previously mentioned, so it kind of lands on the ground somewhere where the shooter was, and the bullet is down range. So a cartridge case would be fired, Ammunition would be unfired with the bullet still in the case. Just one second, Ron. I'm going to grab mine. Do you recall the, the manufacturer of the, of the ammunition that you reviewed, that you used? Well, the manufacturer is stamped onto the base of the cartridge case. And in this case, it stated Wolf, W-O-L-F, and that is a common manufacturer of this type of ammunition. And you also reviewed some, you got that from the Sheriff's Department? I did. Do you remember what exhibit, what uh, item number it was? I'd have to check my report. Go ahead and refresh your recollection, look at your report. The ammunition I used was item number five, J as in John, A as in Adam. Well, yes, I'm close for me. Because yes, I want to just show him. Yes, Actually, I'm going to have you, do you, you don't still have your gloves on, do you? I'll do it. Can you do two things at once as you're opening it up? Can I can. I Those shell, you're going to be opening up a, an envelope there. It's going to have some items in there. Those items, did you put any items in the box at, when, you, when you finished your analysis and testing? Um, I did not. I resealed my test back in the packaging that the ammunition came from. Okay. I want you to open that up. Okay. It's opened. Take a peek inside. Do you recognize what's inside? Uh, these appear to be... 
uh, test fires from the Rifle 101. And what's the, those are the shell casings? Yes, just fired cartridge cases. All right, and approximately how many are in there? I'll have to count them. Let me count them. Sure, you can count them real quick. More than two. Looks like ten. Ten. And are those the shell casings similar to the ones found in scene, found on the scene that, in this case? They are. They are uh, 7.62 by 39 caliber Wolf brand cartridge cases. And those, Matt, those are the ones that you use to test this weapon? I use that same type to test this firearm. Right. I see the benefit of using a bigger table here. I'm going to show you what's in Government Exhibit 34. I'm going to show you image 4434. Just for, well, it's going to be. Do you see that image? Let me zoom it. I can see it. What, is that? what does that look like? What image does that look like? Well, just based on my training experience and knowing what this is, it is likely a 7.62 by 39 caliber cartridge case. I'll we'll show you image 4435. Same thing? Yes, 4435 appears to be also a 7.62 by 39 caliber cartridge case. And those match or similar to the ones in the envelope, right? Yes, appear to be same caliber cartridge type and make of the casing itself. I'm going to show you what's been marked as, and you reviewed crime scene photos, correct? I did. I'm going to show you what's been marked as exhibit, same exhibit 34, but image 4438. You recognize that? I do. Here, may we publish for the jury? On, con, on, on agreement with counsel? The objection. And just, it's subject to the stipulation that we talked about earlier today. Do right. you want me to talk to the jury any more about that, or do you want just to leave it? About the, I think that'd be helpful. Which, to leave it? To, to just explain to the jury. Okay. All right, so this is, uh, thanks. This is what I was talking to you about before, taking a witness out of order. Now, remember also we talked about any exhibit that comes into evidence that the court admits there has to be what we call foundation. Some witness has got to come in and testify to establish that um, this, whatever the item is, it's relevant to this case. So, for example... Uh, if there's a, and I'm just making this up, okay, this is not on this case. If there's a bullet found or a casing found, you know, this witness is about to testify to his opinion about some of that. Someone's got to come in, sorry, someone's got to come in and say that was a bullet or casing or whatever that was found at the scene of this alleged crime, not just some random bullet or casing that they found. So that's foundational. That's an example of, of foundation. Someone's got to come in and testify. Whatever this gentleman's going to testify to is something that relates to this case, like, you know, a casing that was found at the scene. So in order to get this gentleman on and make sure we finish his testimony so he can get on his way this afternoon or today, there's an agreement we call a stipulation. We had a preliminary instruction about that. A stipulation is nothing more than agreement between the parties, state and defense, that this witness can be taken out of order and that this, what's now going to be portrayed to you, there has been no foundation yet established to it um, as to what it is and where it was taken. 
but the defense has agreed with the state that we can take this gentleman out of order, but there will be required to be a witness who will come in at a later time to establish that foundation, which is usually established before the witness testifies. Okay? Good enough? Yes. Any questions about that? Thank you. All right. You can go forward. It can be published. This is uh, Exhibit 34, page 4438. Is that correct? correct. All right. What, what are we seeing here, Rick? What you're seeing in this photograph is the documentation of the fired cartridge cases that were ultimately collected as evidence. I'm going to go back to, believe it or not, that was the very first one I wanted to show. I'm going to go back to images 4434 and 4435. That's the image we just saw together, right? Yes. All right, and you still have the envelope in front of you, right? I do. So got your gloves on? I do. All right. Can you um, hold up one of the shell casings in that envelope? Do like a little thing like that for everyone. And Your Honor, can he just stand up a little bit so he can walk the perimeter yeah. here? Sure. Thank you, Rick. And that showcasing is similar to the one in 4434. It is. And just so, because I showed, I talked about this one too. I showed you 4435. That one too, right? Yes. And then finally, Four four three six. Four four three six also appears to be a seven point six two by thirty nine caliber cartridge case. And just one more of those. I can see it. I see it. You want to, you can draw on that screen. You want oh. to circle it, top top left hand corner to activate it, and then you can put a circle around where it's at. There's a little stylus there. Can I just point it to you, Rick? Sure. <laughs> is this the image right there? It is. Okay. So it's the bottom left of that image, right? It's like the 9 o'clock position yeah. of that photograph. Much better way of describing it. 9 o'clock position. Yeah. Go ahead. So, this might see if this thing's working. IT. Um, see here on these corners? Here it says, you can just draw on it, actually. Try so. All that teaching now, I'm just going to take it away from you. Yeah. Do you know how many, approximately how many shell casings there were found on scene? I believe there are ultimately nine. Just so I can show the 4439 again. Those shell cases we just saw in those images, they're from this scene, right? Yes. Yeah. 
And those, what are those little yellow things? Just the little tents, what are those? Those are pretty standard evidence markers that I see in most of my crime scenes. And they're just marking where the casings are found, right? Yes, and there's photographic scales on them for taking photographs with measurements in them. Show you four four same exhibit thirty four image four 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 zero different image of what we just saw yeah four 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 zero appears to be the same image just a different location or same area just taken from a different perspective we're going to do a close up a real close up here what do you see on this is exhibit image I'm sorry exhibit 34 image 4442 what do you see on there 4442 appears to be another photograph of a fired 7.62 by 39 millimeter cartridge case. And just so we have a point of reference, you see the number one on there? I do. You see the number one on the screen? I do. Okay. a closer shot with someone's hand. You see that? Yes. That's 4443. I'm just going to do just do one more for the illustrative. Image is image 4444. See that image? I do. Four 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 is another fired cartridge case with a marking number two next to it. Yes. And all those shell cases, these shell cases you're seeing match the one that's in that envelope, right? Appear to be the same type and caliber. When you came down to Arizona, your goal was to check the, the operability and the functionality of the weapon? Yes. Explain to the jury what that entailed. Um, simply examining it and test firing it. And part of the examination is to look for defects or alterations to the firearm. And of course, any safety concerns of firing the firearm and ensuring that the magazine fits in chambers and cycles properly. Do you recall any, any um, functionality issues with the weapon? No. Any defects with the weapon? No. In your opinion, did it operate as intended? It did. And you test fired that weapon? I did. And how'd you, what, what goes into the test firing of the weapon? Pretty simple, after my examination, I check the bore to be sure there's no obstructions inside the barrel, because that could be bad. And I had ammunition there from evidence, so I used that. I used the magazine from evidence and test fired like anyone would fire a firearm. And with this weapon, when you tested it, how far were you away when you tested it? I did set up some panels a little over 100 yards away and to 
shoot at. So I'd have a target base, and those shots were fired from a rest, meaning a, a stand that I placed the firearm in, and everything functioned properly. Why'd you pick a little bit over 100 yards? Well, I knew that was the approximate distance of in question here, and I also wanted to see if the bullet was stable in flight at that range, and that's something I've seen, especially some of the AK pattern rifles, is they're fired so many times that the rifling and rifling are spiral, cut, spiral cuts in the barrel to give the bullet stability in flight, like a football, and if that rifling is damaged or altered or corroded, it affects the flight of the bullet. So um, that was one of the things that I wanted to test while I was here. It was, a, was that bullet stable at that distance, meaning is it making nice clean holes into my target? I'm just going to show you, it's, been, it's going to be marked as government exhibits 74 and 103 to 110. And what I want you to do, do you have scissors still up there? I do. You have your glove on still? Yes. You're learning. Thanks, Rick. I am learning. Permission to approach, Your Honor? You mind Inside 74 is another envelope. You like me to open that one? Too? I do. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Seventy-four was marked item one, J as in John, A as in Adam. And inside that second envelope is a fired cartridge case. Can you put it up? Appears to be well it is. 7.62 by 39 millimeter fired cartridge case with the wolf head stamp. I know, I know you can't talk about it, but that, does that look like a similar image of one of the rounds or spent shell casings in the images we saw? It appears to be the same caliber and type. Okay. I'm, just, I'm not going to ask you to do the, 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 all of these, but open up exhibit 10. There's a bigger envelope that says 103 to 106. Just open that package up, and I just want you to just look at, just give me one of those in there, and we'll do the same thing with just one of those in there. Okay. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? I said okay, yes. Oh, yes. okay. Got you. So States Exhibit 103 to 106 was my item numbers for the purposes of my report, 22JA, 23JA, 24JA, and 25JA. Take them off. Don't take them off. Sorry. Sorry to catch you. Which one are you going to show me? So the envelope I pulled out was 105. Can you just open up 105 for me? Oh, I'm sorry. Is it open? Yes. Take it out. Show it to the jury for me. And what does that look like? This is a, another 7.62 by 39 fired cartridge case with wolf head stamp. And I know you can't testify to this because you weren't there, but does that look like same, one of the same rounds that was in the images I showed you? It appears to be the same caliber and cartridge type. All right. May I approach to collect? Can you put 105 back in that big round?
So I just want to make sure we all understand the sequence of events we just went through. The shell casings that were located with ex State Exhibit 101, the spent shell casings, you got that in your head? Yes. Do they match the ones that we just saw in Government Exhibit 74, and I think you looked at Government Exhibit 105? Did they? Yes, they all appear to be Wolf brand 762 by 39 millimeter fired cartridge cases. And those appear to match the ones on the photographs. Well, match means something different to me than to you. I'm, I'm uh, sorry. They appear to be similar in make and model. Thanks for clarifying. So, appear to be similar. When you fire the government exhibit 101, which is the AK, I'm just going to call it the AK. Is that? When you fire the AK, you testified no functionality issues, correct? Correct. No operation issues? Correct. And did, did the... Did the projectile come out of the gun in the intended fashion? It did. <coughs> Straight? <clears throat> yes. And just so I understand, this weapon and those projectiles, you looked at autopsy pictures, right? I do. You also looked at clothing pictures of the victim. I did. I'm going to show you Government Exhibit 14.2, image 6350, under the same conditions as before with defense. I'll show, show, us, show us first so defense can see what I'm showing. And for the record, again, same, I guess, deferred objection pending foundation. Move to publish for the jury. Yes. You see, let me zoom out. What's this image of? And this image is a photograph taken by the medical examiner, as I believe it to be, of the entrance wound. Anything unique about that entrance room, considering this weapon and those projectiles? Well, in my opinion, this wound Thank appears you. to be irregular, meaning not circular. Can you, is it helpful to draw why it's irregular versus circular? Sure, I'm going to draw off to the side, but it's, we would expect to see a circular, oh my gosh, let's try that again. A circular entrance, where this is more oval. Apologize for the drawing here, but I'm looking for a clean circular hole, and this is not. It's a, we call it an irregular hole or oval shaped defect. And you also looked at the clothing of the victim, correct? Yes. And you saw the, the entry wound or the entry, entry, entry um, hole of the victim's clothing. Yes, the bullet defect in the victim's clothing. And did the, what was the, anything special about the entry hole of the, clo the victim's clothing? Well, as with the autopsy photo, the Clothing also exhibited irregular type defect. Just so this is in your report, I just want to show you the image that you looked at. And you also looked at some of the clothing, but this is the one of the images that you looked at, right? Yes. Right. And the do you recall where the entry wound entry was on this photo? Before he does that, let's identify the exhibit. Oh, sorry about that. Exhibit 35, image 028. Thank you. And this photograph is a um, photograph of the decedent as he, he was located. And we, you were asking about the entrance. Yeah, do you, do you recall? Of the, the right flank, meaning the right side. On the, can you just do a little oh. picture thing? Here. Where all the staining is at, right? Yes, where the blood deposition is. And just so I understand, that gun and those projectiles can cause this injury from 100 and 
100 plus yards? In my opinion, yes. In the design, we talked about this, the design of that projectile, what's the purpose of that projectile, the design of that projectile? Well, the 7.62 by 39 cartridge is a military cartridge, as I mentioned earlier. And military cartridges are designed not to fragment, meaning they're full metal jackets. And the idea being if, um, I mean, again, this is historic, but from my understanding, the idea being for that is if you wound someone on the battlefield, it takes two people to take that person off the battlefield. And so the idea is you want the bullet to perforate, meaning go all the way through the target, and that's what these cartridges are designed to do. Whereas your law enforcement type of bullets are designed to enter and not exit, meaning expand and deposit all their energy into the target. So there's two, there's lots of classes, but there's two major classes of bullets that I see, full metal jackets or ball ammo like we're seeing here, and then jacketed hollow points or soft points, which are designed to fragment in the body. And um, from a little bit over 100 yards away, using the AK and those rounds, what would you expect to happen with, with this projectile hitting a body? Unless it hit a major structure like the spine, I would expect it to enter and exit, meaning perforate the body. Let me go back to um, the, is there a technical term for what's happening with this round as it enters the body? Oh, I thought I ever used a technical term. <laughs> is, it, is there a technical term for well, it? Well, it's an irregular entrance wound. So uh, one term could be used that the bullet's in yaw, meaning it's not stable. It's flying irregularly. And so one example of that would be a um, ricochet sound you hear in the movies. That's a bullet in yaw as it's spinning through the air. It's making a whirring sound because it's not stable. It's not flying straight. So that's one of the technical terms we use to describe potentially the bullet behavior going here, that the bullet is in yaw and not flying straight. And so your, your opinion is this, this entry wound is created by a bullet in yaw. Well, what causes a bullet to be in yaw could be an intermediate object. So, and I published a paper and actually presented on this very topic where a bullet would strike something even slightly, and that impact would create the yaw, meaning knock the bullet out of its stable flight that it has. And I think, in my opinion, I think that's what's occurring here. And you fired this weapon, right? So without anything interfering from the weapon to the target, right? Nothing in between. I did. When I fired it, I did not impact any intermediate objects, intentionally. Yeah. Any yaw? No. All of my witness panels that I fired, my targets, all had clean holes or defects, meaning the bullet was stable. And you're familiar with this, the scene here, right? You're familiar with the topography, the trees and landscapes? Vegetation. I am. I did look at the scan data. And... Are there things in, in this scene that can create yaw of a, of a bullet that's been fired? I would say not several, but many mesquite trees. <laughs> they were at the scene that I saw on the point cloud and on the crime scene photos and on the drone footage to indicate that, yes, there's many objects between the house and the decedent. And so explain to the jury if a bullet fired from this weapon, that round, from that distance, if it hits... A trunk is going to stop the bullet, right? If it hits a trunk? Tree trunk or car yeah. trunk? Oh, good question. Tree trunk. Yes, or a branch. I mean, anything that could, uh, again, just deviate it from its flight. In, in this bullet, with the velocity it has, it can go through a <coughs> branch. It can go through, obviously, twigs or things like that, right? Yes. But any of those things can cause a yaw. Yes, and it would still continue on its flight path, right? Generally, and it depends on how destabilizable it is, how much it will deviate from the flight path.
And when you looked at this weapon, this AK-47, do you recall the sighting and what it was sighted for? Well, as I stated, that you can adjust that rear sight with the little button and you push it and it slides the rear sight up and down. And there's a P setting, which is the general purpose setting. I forgot what the P stands for. It's in another language. But typically, my understanding is it's a 300-yard zero, meaning it should be point aim, point of impact at 300 yards. But again, that's up for debate depending on the rifle and how it's set up. So that as you, as you, te- as you received it and as you tested that weapon, that weapon was sighted for 300 yards. It had the P. It was in the P setting when I looked at it, yes. There's been, there's, by me, I had a question. Could this injury, let me go back. I don't know why I do that. This injury, could it be what we call bullet fall? Do you know what bullet, am I using a layman's way of explaining that? Um, This is something I explored in my 800-yard case, and in my opinion, no, this could not be bullet fall. What's bullet fall, so we can explain? So there's a, an angle for which you can fire a rifle or a pistol that would be the maximum range, meaning gravity versus velocity of the bullet. And so most firearms, it's about 33, 35 degrees. So if you hold it at 35 degrees, it's going to go its maximum distance that it can. And if you go beyond 30 degrees, it's going to run out of velocity and then it's going to start falling and it's going to lose its velocity so um, i did extensive testing on that and there's published papers on this too when i had my 800 yard case and so a falling bullet um, only is about 180 feet per second um, about enough to i mean if you shot it straight in the air and it came down it's about enough to give you a, a knot on your head or a bruise on your shoulder it typically won't, pen- if it penetrates, it'll be very superficial because it's just the velocity that it has is just from gravity as it's falling. And so anything beyond, you know, 30, 40, 50 degrees, it's going to be a falling bullet and not velocity from the shot itself. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, so when you look at that wound, is this, uh, I think you, I just want to make sure I understand. When you look at that wound, look at this weapon and look at the, the, the shell casings and the rounds projectile used, is this a result of a bullet fall or is this a result of a weapon, the, the projectile being still on its trajectory at full, full velocity? It's my opinion that this was a direct fire shot and not a falling bullet. You also looked at, you also gave an opinion about whether or not this was a possible handgun or a close range shot. Do you recall that? Yes. Walk the jury through what your opinion is about whether or not this is a close range shot or a long shot. Well, there would be two things we'd be looking for for a close range shot. One, I mentioned earlier that there is rapidly expanding gas that pushes the bullet down the barrel. Or that gas has to go somewhere. So it usually follows and sometimes precedes the bullet as it comes out of the barrel. So that gas has a residue that can be chemically tested. There's also unfired, unfired gunpowder that's contained within that gas cloud. And if you're close enough, that will deposit itself on the target, the clothing, the wound, et cetera. And so we can test for that. Secondly, we have an irregular wound, and we know that this firearm fires straight bullets. So something would have had to come in between the shooter and the victim to destabilize that bullet in the path that it would take. So those would be the the two things that we would look for for a close range shot. Additionally, um, a pistol round, um, typically, based on my experience, when unstable pistol rounds hit people, they don't exit because they lose all of their energy as they are unstable flying through the air. Now, this being a military cartridge, much higher velocity, much smaller bullet, So it can be unstable and still manage to perforate a person. So with all those factors, again, was my opinion, it was a distant shot from a rifle. And you had that one case earlier, 800 yards away, 
approximately. Yes. Did the did the the that bullet exit the victim in that case? It did not. It uh, penetrated um, around her armpits and went through her heart and almost exited on her left side. So distance does matter whether or not there's enough velocity for this type of bullet to enter and then exit. Certainly, and it, it did lose, obviously, some velocity traveling 800 yards, but still was lethal at that distance. And you're, in this scenario, in this case, that distance, 100, a little bit over 100 yards, was enough, is a short enough distance for that, gun, for that round to penetrate and exit? Yes. In your opinion, it was a long rifle that shot that round that killed this victim? The, the wound is consistent to a rifle round. Let me also ask you, you considered the ejection pattern. Did you review the ejection pattern in the, in, that the DPS did in this case? I did. And they did their own testing of the, of the weapon, right? Yes. And you reviewed that ejection pattern? I did, and I saw a similar <coughs> ejection pattern, although I didn't map it, when I was doing my own test firing. So, so we, essentially, we have three possible ejection patterns. We've got the crime scene, we've got DPS, and we have yours. Yes. All right. All three of those ejection patterns, are they similar using this weapon? Well, I'm not sure where the, the shooter was specifically. A, when we do our testing, we know right where, the, right where the firearm is versus the pattern. But the pattern size was similar in all three areas. It's a, some dispersion and typically to the right of the firearm. And that's been my experience with these types of firearms. Just one second, Your Honor. I need to grab a photo. I'm going to try to do this with this photo. I think we've got a, a decent photo here. I'm going to show you what's been marked ex State Exhibit 34, image 4440. Oh, you can. Yeah. You see that, Rick? Yes. And that is, would that be similar to like an ejection pattern? These are, just so we all understand what we're looking at, these are markings, yellow markings, right? Yes. And I know you were not here, but assuming those markings are with spent shell casings, right? Yes. If, a, if someone's standing, you see where the detectives are? If someone's standing to the 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock side to that, you see the 3 o'clock? Can you just draw on the map 3 o'clock oh, yes. where the shell casings are on the far side of the photo? Yeah, something like that, right? Somewhere close to that range, right? Would those shell casings, that ejection pattern, be conducive, be what we would possibly see from someone standing in that position firing that weapon? Yes, could be. And do you, it's like brick and patio, do you see that? Do you see where the detectives are standing or the officers are standing? I do. And that, you don't know this, but that looks like a patio deck, right? It is a patio deck. I had I looked at the three D scanning, and I'm familiar with the area. Okay, yeah. so you you understand we're referencing to cones. Do you remember seeing cones or seeing only three D scan? Yes. And the jury has seen cones. They've they've seen plenty of photos with cones in it, and so we're talking about the cones on the patio deck, right? Yes. And if a shooter is standing at that location firing that weapon with those rounds, would that would this be a 
an ejection pattern that you could see that could, that could result? It is consistent. You got, where'd you get the, for your 3D scan, where'd you get the data for that 3D scan? Um, Arizona DPS did the scanning, and the, the process for that is essentially a, a magic box on a stick, on a tripod, well, I, I, I and think put he's it out. I think he's answered the question. So. He did. I, the, I won't go through Did you also get like a scan plan? Did they, tell you, did they give you a scan plan for that or no? Um, I did the scan plan and provided it to them. No, did, did, with DPS, when they provide you, they provide you the raw data? Yes. They provide you any documentation to go with it? Um, all I wanted was the raw data so I could oh. uh, register it myself. And you prepared the, the output for the 3D scan? Yes. What was the distance from, for your 3D scan, what was the distance from the patio, from the cone, to where the victim's body was found? Uh, it was a consistent with the measurement that the drone had already measured. So I just confirmed that measurement. Would 350 feet sound familiar? Yes. And before I get to my final cl few questions, so with the ejection pattern, the type of weapon, the rounds, can we just call them wolf rounds? Is it, can I just say wolf? Sure. Wolf rounds. Um, the wound and the clothing, what's your opinion about where the shooter was in this case? Well, all the evidence I looked at is, is consistent with the shooter standing on that porch for that. Based on the physical evidence that I looked at that I'm aware of, the shot could have come from the porch. Just one second, Your Honor. We're almost done, Rick. I have to show you something, but it wasn't with my... He's a witness? Yeah. I need to get from We're having a, an item brought in, one of the, sh the shell cases that you use to... We got to get the lot number and so forth. Okay. All right. And as you're getting that, Rick, um, so the... The round that entered the victim's body and exited, do you know what happened to it? To my knowledge, it was not recovered. And
All right, the jury's absent. Everyone have a seat. Yeah, uh, you can step out. This doesn't involve you. All right, Ms. Hunley, tell me what you wanted to discuss. Your Honor, I, I know the court ordered no projection of the jurors, and I just had some folks advise me that they're watching the live feed and that there are jurors that are being projected on the live feed. Is it people from your office or just who's, um, who's the source of the investigator advised me that um, he received the information. I can have him come in and tell you where he received the information if you'd like. Investigators telling me that an investigator from our office, David Bat, called to indicate that the live feed was showing the two jurors. Uh, do we know? Or I don't show, how many jurors. Do uh, I, I don't know how many jurors said there was. Uh, but do you know which ones? No, sir. Would you like me to call over to the office to find out, Your Honor? I don't have a text from him. I, I can call the David Bat if you'd like, Your Honor. I don't. I can't. I didn't get any additional information. I just thought the court might have find that concerning. All right. Um, who's in charge of the pool camera for today? Okay. Sorry to put you on the spot. I'm sure you're aware of the rules, right? That we can't take any video show anything that shows the identity of the jurors. Anything you want to tell me? Um, well, there was a moment where I was panicked, and I was not fully paying attention, and I just briefly showed the jurors and they were blurred out a couple of jurors right here. And the moment I noticed that, I just panicked back. All right. And, I, and, I, and when I happened, I was like, oh, gosh. And I was like, I'm going to take All right, thank you, thank you. Well, I don't think there's anything we can do about that. Um, this person who's op operating the uh, camera is well aware of the rules. She explained what happened. She's gonna be very careful in the future so that it doesn't happen again. I don't think there's anything more we need to do at this time. Um, I mean, Does anyone want me to inform the two jurors that their identity might have been shown? I mean, you know, anyone can come into the to the courthouse and courtroom and see the jurors, but now there's a there's an image of them that is accessible. State doesn't think that's necessary at all, Your Honor, but we, we'd defer to the court. I, I just know that was the court's order. I just want to make sure the camera folks knew that they were having an issue. It sounds like she already knew. So. Right, I agree. Uh, I agree. They know the rules. And they're obviously going to adhere to the rules. So it's apparently a one-time incident. It just happened once, as far as you know. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. That's right. Thank you for your apology, and thank you for being, you know, uh, so upfront with us about what happened. But the uh, camera person knows what has to be done, and it was a one-time thing where she swung the camera a couple millimeters or something too far to the right, and it happened. So. Witness. Yeah. Right. Maybe, you know, and uh, I don't know if it happened when he gets down, you know, just when he gets down, just walk across, or any other witness gets down, just don't follow him. Right? All right. Any other record anyone wants to make? Okay, so we'll come back in about, let's make it about 20 minutes, month, 10 10. We'll be in recess. Please rise.
rise up here, por favor. Thank you, everyone. Please have a seat. Sir, you can come back forward. We'll get the witness back on the stand. All right, we resolved the issue. We've got all the jurors present, counsel, and the defendant. And the wit yes, sir, come on back up. The witness is retaking the stand. You can go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, is your microphone on? Uh, Detective Anza, can you approach and open up what's going to be State Exhibit 1, 2, 3, which is the right one? And Rick, this is your reference to 5JA in your report. Oh, the ammunition I used? Yeah. Okay. Oh, this is 1, 2, 3. for Detective Anza to approach the witness? Sure. So is this, is this, uh, go ahead, okay. Is this exhibit one, two, three, or do you say item one, two, three? Exhibit one, two, three. Exhibit one, two, thanks. And this is still conditioned on the same agreement with defense counsel. So, Mr. Mr. Rick, Rick, can you look inside that? Detective Anza, you can step away if you want. Do you have a glove still, Rick? No. Just, okay. all right, we'll get Thank you. I get you, I get you. What do you see in there? Yes, exhibit one, two, three appears to be the ammunition that I used for my test firing. You can go ahead and take it out. And does that look like the ammunition? Is that, the, is that actually the ammunition you used? Yes. So this is your, this is your exhibit? 5JA. 5JA. Well, yes, it's the exhibit that I looked at. It's not my exhibit. It's I the sheriff's you. office. Sorry, but that's the one that you, test, you took rounds from to test fire. Oh, yes, and you can see my evidence tape, the green evidence tape. And you signed off on that? Yeah, I sealed the box with my green evidence tape, and the inner packaging also has my initials and date from 7-7-23. And you compared the make and model of, of those rounds to the rounds that DPS used in their testing, right? Yes, and you compared those rounds with DPS and then also with the, the spent shell casings on the crime scene, correct? Correct. What's your, what's your conclusion about the make and model? All the same, Wolf brand ammunition, 7.62 by 39 millimeter caliber. So all the testing done in this case from the DPS and from you, we're using the same make and model, Wolf projectile round bullet. Yes. Detective Anza can, oh, I got it. Yes. Yes. I'm going to show you government exhibit 102. Do you have scissors? I do. You want to open that up? Zero two appears to be a magazine and some ammunition. To what? What? What are they specifically? It is another 
one. Yes, one AK-47 type magazine and 7.62 by 39 millimeter caliber cartridges unfired. Same ones that we just saw in the exhibit one, two, three, right? Same type. Same type. And those showcasings, so that, that round is similar to the showcasings found at the crime scene. Yes. And that magazine, you said that was an AK magazine? Yes. And if you know, would that AK magazine fit that gun? It should. I have not tried it. Okay. And since I'm on the... Let me grab that from you. Since I'm on the gun, um, do you know the approximate dimensions of the gun? Like the total length? Total length, barrel. About 34 inches. And the barrel, do you know? I didn't measure it specifically, but they're typically about 22, or about two feet long, a little bit less. Promise you, Rick, I'm almost done. I'm gonna show you government exhibit 34, image 4193. Under the same conditions with defense. Do you see that image? I do. And we see the, the little tent, right? Yes, the evidence marker number one. And this is at night, so I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to get in there. Do you see a, a spent shell casing in there? I do. Can you circle that? I can. Okay, and you don't know, and obviously you can't testify to when this was collected versus the other shell cases, right? Correct. And you can't testify to the, to the, the canine in the picture, can you? I cannot. Okay. I'm going to show you government exhibit 34, image 4485. Mush, no, I'm sorry, I scratched that. 4476. Let me zoom out. What's that an image of? 4476 appears to be an image of the clothing from the decedent. That you reviewed? Yes. Is there a hole in this? Yes, there's a possible bullet defect in the shirt. Can you circle it? And looking at that hole, I mean, there's a lot of variability here, but is that, I'm sensing you're a perfectionist, Rick. Looking at that hole, is that hole, that hole be caused by a bullet in yaw? It could be, yes. I'm going to show you exhibit 34, image 4476. Is that a close-up of that same photo? Yes, 4476 is a close-up of the defect on the shirt. And then we have a better picture of that hole, right? Yes. And again, what's, do you know what's around the hole, what the staining is? Appears to be blood. What number was this? Four four seven six. I thought the one before that was four 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 seven five was the one prior. Okay. And did you, did you also review the exit wound of the victim? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as government exhibit 34, image 4497. Does that appear to be what you saw and reviewed for your report? Yes. 
And is that hole, would that hole be consistent with a bullet in yaw? Yes. Would that hole be, that exit wound be consistent with a bullet that's a, a Wolf brand bullet? It's not inconsistent with a Wolf brand bullet. Would that hole be consistent or inconsistent with a Wolf brand bullet being fired from an AK-47? It could be, yes. And there was some, um, let me talk about you, there was, in your report, there was some discussion about a, well, let's talk about the yaw, the yaw of the bullet, right? Yes. And you testified that yaw can be caused by something in between the shooter and the, the victim. Yes, we typically refer to that as an intermediate object. And you, were, you had reviewed some evidence about a possible tree limb in this case, right? Yes, there was a tree limb that was identified on, in, in the crime scene as a potential bullet impact site. And I'm not asking you to testify about where that tree limb was found and what direction it was found. I'm not asking for that. I want to show you the tree limb. I marked the last page of my set. There we are. I'm going to show you what's been marked as government exhibit 71, but these don't have an image number on back, so I'm going to designate them 71A and B. Let me show you government exhibit 71A. That is the remaining part of the, the branch. Is that right? Yes. And it looks like it's been, we have someone sawing the base of it off, but the top part, can you circle the top part where I'm referring to where, it, that looks like it was broken off, right? It does. And you're not here testifying to what possibly caused the breakage of that, right? I am not. Right. The question I have for you is, is that branch, you see the size of this branch? Let me show you a different picture. That branch, can that branch cause a yaw? If, if, the round, if a round hits that branch, can it cause a yaw? Yes, that would be an intermediate object that could cause yaw if a bullet strikes it. And that branch, would that branch necessarily stop the bullet or... The bullet would just continue on, but in yaw. Well, I haven't done my own empirical testing in mesquite trees, but with other trees in Washington, I would expect a, a branch of that diameter to not stop, a 7.62 by 39. Because that wolf bullet is a pretty serious bullet. Yeah, it's traveling out of the muzzle about 2,400 feet per second, about twice as fast as a 9 millimeter, for example. I'm going to show you, I'm just about done here, Rick. I'm going to show you Government Exhibit 121, scenario view from a drone image. Do you see? Oh, upside down. Do you see that? The markings are not part of, from the drone. The markings are for us to identify some things. But do you recognize that photo? I do. And the, just so that we all understand each other, Exhibit 121, the blue is one spent showcasing off to the right? 
Yes. And the yellow is the remaining eight shell casings in yellow, right? Yes. You see the, can you draw a circle around the cones, the orange cones? And you see the ejection pattern, right? Yes. Or the re result of the ejection of the, of the casings, right? I do. If a shooter is standing where the cones are, would the, the ejection pattern in yellow and blue be consistent with if a shooter is standing where the cones are? That is certainly one possible location. And also, um, do you know... Is this the cone start for the measurement to the victim's body, the 350 feet? That's how I understood it. And 350 divided by three, do you, can you do math for me? About 115 yards. 115 yards. Just one second, Your Honor. So the questions I have, Your Honor. Can... Um, Oh, we'll wait till the end for it to seal up the boxes. That's all the questions I have. Cross-examination. Thank you, Judge. Morning. Good morning. You hear me okay? I can. Okay, perfect. So I just want to get a little bit of background information. You did not visit the scene of the crime in this case. Is that correct? That is correct. So you reviewed photographs from that scene, right? Yes. And you reviewed, I think you said it was a Leica scan of that scene. Is that right? Yes. Did you notice any differences? Were you aware, let me back up a little, that that Leica scan was taken in a significant period of time after the date of this offense? It was. When was the date of that scan, if you recall? I'd have to check my report, but it was later. There were lots more leaves on the trees, I think is probably where you're going with that. And you can check your report if you want okay. to. Do you have it up there with you? Yeah, let me look real quick. Six twenty nine of 2023 is when it was scanned. Okay. And you mentioned there are more leaves on the branches in the scan versus at the time of the event, right? Yes. Was there, were there other alterations to the scene that you were aware of or made aware of? Not that I was particularly looking at. I was more concerned with um, what potential line of sights you could see um, with the point cloud versus the crime scene. Photograph. And I'm referring, if you remember, um, specifically to a prickly pear cactus. Do you recall in the photographs there being a prickly pear cactus near the area where the shell casings are located versus later that cactus is no longer there? That does ring a bell, but I'm, I can't confirm that for sure. Okay, but the photographs at the of the scene would contain more accurately what was present on the scene versus the scan. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And you're approached by the state in this case, and you're provided with some background information about the case. Is that right? Yes. What background information were you provided with in a nutshell? Well, I listed in my report several things. Um, as I stated earlier, I typically don't look at uh, witness statements until I objectively look at the evidence to see what my impression is of what was collected and what the crime scene photos tell me, but I was submitted quite a few documents to look at. But I was prim primarily interested in what the ballistic evidence was and what the crime scene photos told me. And from the crime scene photos and ballistic evidence, you know that there is a group of shell casings, correct? Yes. And that group of shell casings is located in this patio area, correct? It is. And you know that there is a body that was discovered at this location, correct? Yes. And you know, I believe, is it from the Leica scan, you know the approximate location of the body. Is that correct? Well, two, the drone was the initial distance determination. And then when I received the Leica scan data, and uh, what they did for the Leica scan was a cone off the area where the body was recovered. Of course, the body wasn't in the scan because it had been removed. So I had an approximate location of where the body was recovered, and I compared that to the drone measurement that was taken at the time, and it was consistent. 
And that's approximate, correct? Yes. You don't know the exact specific location of the body, correct? I don't. And were you told or did you receive any information that provided you with the positioning of the body that was discovered? Well, I had photographs of the decedent in place. So that in terms of face down, face up position, is that what you mean? Okay, well, we could start there. So you have photographs of the body, right? Yes. And that tells you that this body is discovered face down, correct? Yes. Or at least that's what the photographs show you. To my understanding, down. correct. Did the photographs show you how that body is positioned with respect to the house or the shell casings? I don't think so. So do you know specifically where the entrance wound, let's say, do you know where that is positioned in relation to the house and the shell casings? No. You don't know where that entrance wound is? Not relative to the scene itself. Uh, there wasn't enough landmarks in those photographs for me to be able to determine where in space the body was. I mean, there was a tree nearby, so a couple of more photographs I might have been able to tell, but with what I was received, I could not. Okay. So you don't know, for example, if the body's face down and the head is pointed towards the house or the feet or vice versa. Correct. I do not know the orientation of the decedent Okay. at recovery. And... Along those lines, too, obviously you didn't know the orientation of this person prior to this person being hit by a bullet, correct? Correct. So you don't know if this person was standing when he got shot, is that right? I have no, no data to support a conclusion on that. And you don't know if he was running or walking or anything like that, right? That's correct. And you don't know if after he got shot, he moved or took a step or staggered. You don't know anything like that. Is that right? I do not. There was, I didn't see any evidence of bloodletting that might indicate movement after. But, I mean, with a small caliber bullet such as thirty caliber, you might not see that initially. So, again, there's no, no data to draw information or conclusions from. Okay. And so I think you mentioned... Um, you know, using like a trajectory rod if there's a car with bullet holes in it, right? Correct. And sometimes that can give you a good idea of where this bullet came from when it hit this car. Is that correct? Yes. Now, that's fair to say that's only going to work if you know, for example, that the car was not moving, right? Well, bullets travel fast enough that, typically speaking, if the car is moving, the, the bullet path into the car won't change, but you don't know exactly where the car is in space. I guess that's your question. Right. Okay. So it, it gives you approximations, right? Yes. Based on other factors that you might know and you might not know, correct? Yes. And so if a person's going to be shot, for example, and you don't know where he was standing or how he was moving or what position or direction he was in before he got shot, then doing something like a rod from the wound would not be very helpful. Is that right? Yes. Well, rods and bodies aren't typically, I guess, the practice now because bodies can move so much in space and so quickly. And an upward trajectory might be flat because a person's slightly bent over or some other reasoning for that. And also, we talked about yaw with intervening objects earlier. Um, the bullet can yaw in the body as well. And so the tissue impact could veer that bullet from its original path as it travels through the body. And I've definitely seen that experimentally and in case work. So that's another, probably, in my opinion, another reason why medical examiners don't typically put rods into bodies. And I'm gonna, I want to come back to that in a minute. Um, but first I want to talk a little bit about the shell casings. Okay, that is a piece of evidence that you did examine, correct? The casings from the scene, I actually didn't examine, just photographs only, but they were consistent with everything that I just previously testified to. Right. So you get photographs of this group of shell casings at the scene. Is that correct? Yes. And then you're provided this weapon, right? Yes. And you're supposed to test this weapon to get an idea of where these shell casings land when they eject from this weapon, correct? Well, I didn't do a ejection pattern on this rifle. That was another examiner. Um, I was just simply observing my testing on where the cartridge cases were landing to see if it was consistent with what was previously reported, if that makes sense. That other examiner was Aaron Brudenell, is that correct? Yes. 
So he tests the weapon and he makes a determination about the pattern of the shell casings, correct? Yes, in this case. And you reviewed his report prior to coming to your own conclusions, is that correct? I did. And you also mentioned that you fired yourself this weapon from a stand, is that correct? I did. But you didn't draw any conclusions based on that shell casing distribution, correct? Correct. Is that because that was on a different kind of surface? Well, it was two surfaces um, at that particular range. Right about where the ejection port was, there was concrete and there was gravel. And I wasn't set up in my one visit to do that type of examination. You have to rope it off, and I usually scan. I usually 3D scan my ejection patterns. I didn't have that ability. I was simply just observing the general characteristics of where the cartridge cases were um, landing when I did my test firing. So Aaron Brudnell is the one who did the more detailed and thorough shell casing testing, correct? Yes. You grid it off, and you have a certain height, and you measure all those things. Yes. And you agree that different surfaces can impact the way that shell casings are distributed, correct? Absolutely. So, for example, if we're firing a weapon and shell casings come out, and it's cement, they're going to bounce around when they land on the cement, correct? Yes. And if I'm on wet grass or muddy, a muddy area or something, they're not going to bounce around as much. Is that correct? That's true. So depending on the conditions on the ground, literally, <laughs> that sort of depends how these shell casings get distributed. Is that correct? That's correct. And there can be other objects. We talked about intervening objects with bullets, but there can be other objects that interfere with shell casings as well, correct? Yes. So that prickly pear cactus that we mentioned is an object that could, for example, interfere with how those shell casings get distributed, correct? Yes. And all of that can interfere with a determination of how distant the shooter is from those shell casings. Is that correct? It can. So the best way to test, for example, you see a crime scene and there are shell casings there. And from the shell casings, you're trying to determine how far away from that group of shell casings the person firing this weapon was standing approximately. Is that, that's what you're trying to determine, correct? Approximate shooter location, yes. And so if you're going to make that determination, the best practice is to test the weapon on a surface that's very similar to the surface at the crime scene, correct? Yes. Because otherwise it can be off significantly, correct? Yes. Okay. You try to control your variables. Right. And other variables involved in shell casing testing, does that include the height off of the ground that the weapon is fired? Yes. So can, we, can you explain that a little bit? How does the height of the weapon affect a shell casing pattern distribution? Well, think of a firearm as a system of tools that work together to fire this cartridge. And there's two pretty significant tools in the firearm that help or assist with that ejection pattern. One is called the extractor, which extracts. We're very simple in firearms. And there's an ejector that ejects. And the extractor is a hook, and the ejector is a post. And as it comes to the rear, they interact with each other, and that's what causes the cartridge case to fly out of the firearm. And there's inherent variability in that. And if you were to control all the variables you could and just fire this firearm in one place, one position, you're still going to get a little bit of distribution error, if you will. And so anything that's going to affect that interaction with the extraction and ejection could affect where they land, meaning how you're holding the firearm, what ammunition you're using, and, of course, what height you are off the ground. So, and there are all, all different positions that people fire from, too, right? Yes. So you could be standing and holding a rifle up at your shoulder, correct? Yes. Or you could be kneeling and holding that same rifle, correct? Yes. You could be in a prone position on your stomach and holding that same rifle, correct? You can. And you can be aiming up or down or anywhere in between, correct? Yes. Do all of those things potentially affect the shell casing distribution? Definitely can. And if you're holding, let's just throw another variable in there. What if you're talking about somebody who's a left-handed shooter? Can that affect the way the weapon is held? 
It can. I actually haven't done any pattern testing with left-handed shooters with those kind of rifles, but I mean, anything that could be a variable on how that firearm is held could affect the potential of where they land. Were you told in this case that the suspect was left-handed? I believe that was mentioned at some point. Did you adjust any of your testing to account for that variable? Well, I didn't do the ejection pattern testing, and my testing was done in a rest, so it wasn't right hand, left hand. It was a, a static rest that I placed the rifle in. Okay, so that's a question for Aaron Brudnell, who did that testing. Then. Yeah, save that for him. I will do that. Thank you. <laughs> so when you're talking about what you can learn from a group of shell casings, for example, if you just stumble upon a group of shell casings out in the middle of nowhere, you could possibly learn what type of ammunition was fired, is that correct? Yes. And you can tell that from the shell casings themselves, correct? You can, and sometimes firearm type. Sometimes firearm type, correct? Yes. Not always, right? Not always. Because many types of ammunition are compatible with multiple types of firearms, correct? Yes. So from the shell casings that you observed in this case, what could you determine just from looking at those shell casings? What are things that you could determine definitively, conclusively? That they were the AK caliber, meaning the 7.62 by 39. They were wolf head stamp, and they were also steel cartridge cases, which is typical for that type of weapon platform. You say AK caliber. Are those shell casings, is that ammunition that's compatible with other types of weapon besides an AK? Yes, there's many manufacturers that make firearms that will chamber and fire the 7.62 by 39 millimeter. So just from looking at that group of shell casings, you don't know which weapon or which type of weapon was fired. That's correct, right? From my examination, and of course, if they were sent to me, I could do a microscopic comparison and identify them to a specific firearm but I did not do that in this case. You can do that with shell casings? Yes. And how accurate is that? Well, based on my training experience, um, when I identify something, it's, I'm confident that they were fired from that firearm. Okay, and that's only if you do a specific type of testing on the shell casing, correct? Um, yes, not to go into too much detail, but I have a comparison microscope that allows me to look at two things at the same time. So I get test fires from the rifle, I get evidence items, and I look at them simultaneously for the marks left by those system of tools that I just talked about. So the extractor will leave a mark, ejector will leave a mark, the firing pin leaves marks, and those are all individual microscopically. So that's what I'm looking at when I do comparisons. And you didn't do that in this case, right? Correct. Another question for Brood now. Okay. So with what we have right now, we're not sure which weapon these shell casings came from, correct? Correct. Okay. And a group of shell casings, assuming you have the correct weapon for those shell casings. And assuming that you've test fired that weapon, that will tell you approximately the distance that the shooter was standing when that weapon was fired, correct? Yeah, uh, how I report it out is I have a, an area of probability, and I'll draw a circle that based on where this distribution is, the shooter is probably standing in this approximate area. Um, given all those factors and control areas that we were talking about. And just to do kind of a visual, so let's say there's a, can you still hear me? I can. You don't project that well. So let's say there's a pile of shell casings right here, and you've tested the weapon and you've determined the distance of the shooter is about this far. So imagine shell casings right there. And that's, it tells you a distance that's approximate, right? Yes. Yes, but probably not in the corner of the room or in the hallway. Right, so it gives you a margin of error. Yes. Right? And you mentioned a circle, correct? That's how I do it. Um, a lot of people, well, some people will do just grids and mark individual and not do an average. And it just depends on uh, the type of case and what you're trying to demonstrate. Does this work? Is this working? Okay. So if, I, if there's a shell casing pile right there, the shooter, let's say this is the distance approximate that you've determined, could be standing right here, right? Yes. And aiming in this direction, potentially. Yes. But there's a whole circle around here that would also be consistent with where the shooter's standing, right? Do you mean position of the muzzle or the bore? The 
person. So, so, so the, shell casings are right there. Let's, let's say this is the distance you've determined. I know it's not realistic. But person, I'm the shooter. Those are the shell casings. Here's, I'm firing the weapon, right? Shell casings are going this way. This is one position I could be standing in if the distance is correct. Yes. Right? But there's a whole circle that's drawn around this so pile you, of shell casings. So if you walk around the circle with the ejection port facing your circle, I, th right. I think I see where you're, yes. where you're trying to say. So I could be standing here, too, in other words. Yes. Right? And that's still consistent with the pile of shell casing. And I could be standing anywhere around that circle that's not obstructed, right? Yes. Okay. So... So from a pile of shell casings, you're getting a distance and you're getting a, a radius, basically. Yes. And any point along that radius, a, the person could be standing, correct? If I understand your question correctly, yes. Okay. In other words, the shell casings themselves don't determine which direction a person was aiming, right? That's correct. You need other evidence to look at that and to determine that, correct? Yes. You might need actually a fixed point or a known point where the shooter was standing. Is that correct? Or a bullet impact downrange. A bullet impact on something that had a fixed point or a known point, yes. right? Okay, so a bullet impact itself doesn't have a fixed point or a known point, right? Unless it's in something that doesn't move, correct? Correct, stationary object. Right, okay. You mentioned something when you test fired um, the weapon. Oh, and before I move on from that, describe a little bit how possibly aiming in an upward direction versus a downward direction might change the shell casing distribution that you see. Well, it's all geometry. The cartridge case is being extracted and ejected at roughly the same angle. So if you're changing the angle of the bore of that firearm, you know, steering it so... And the distribution on this particular firearm is slightly forward of the shooter and to the right, somewhere around 15 feet or so, just on average. And, but so if you were, and that's from a horizontal bore, and that's how it, the convention is to do this type of testing. Now, if you were to raise or lower that bore to not horizontal to the ground, you're going to change that geometry of that extraction and ejection and could potentially affect the pattern. How much it affects the pattern, it would depend on the testing that you would do. You'd have to do empirical testing to determine what variable, how much is that pattern distribution changing when you move the bore up and down. And so it's possible to do empirical testing to see what changes about a specific weapon or specific shell casing distribution when you fire at various angles, right? Sure, but again, there's a safety concern for that too. As I mentioned earlier, if you hold it about 33 degrees, that bullet will go about two miles almost. So you have to be sure you're in proper conditions to test that. But yes, it can be done. Okay. And so if there are two people who dispute, let's say, the direction of fire, one of them says, you know, this person was firing straight through this mesquite thicket that you mentioned, and another person said the shots were being fired at an upward angle over the top of one of the trees out there. There are empirical tests that can be done to see which scenario is more consistent with the physical evidence, correct? You would have to do that empirical test and you see if the cartridge case distribution would be affected by that type of angle of the rifle. So you could test that? Yes. And then you could come to some conclusions about which scenario is more likely based on the physical evidence, correct? If there was significant variability in the pattern distribution. And that wasn't done in this case, is that correct? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Nobody asked you to do a, a test, to try to test the theory that this was being fired in an upward direction, correct? Correct. Okay. In fact, you were just asked basically to test the theory that these shots were being fired from the general location of the patio to the location of the body. Is that correct? Well, actually, I didn't test that. Um, Brunel did, but it was his report was consistent with someone firing from the patio um, based on the data that I had. What I mean is you, so you, okay, 
let me, let me, ref let me go back. You were asked whether or not the shots being fired from the patio were consistent with the evidence that you observed. Is that correct? Yes. And in your opinion, shots being fired from the patio are consistent with what you observed, correct? Correct. And if I asked you, is the evidence that you observed consistent with somebody standing on the patio and firing in a more upward direction, is that consistent? In terms of the wound and the decedent? In terms of the shell casings. I wouldn't be able to determine that. I mean, again, I would have to do empirical testing, but I don't know if the distribution of the cartridge case would be significantly changed or altered by shooting it in the air. I mean, they're still coming out to the right of the shooter, but there is a geometry difference. And my question is, is it possible that that's a consistent scenario? Somebody's standing on the patio in that approximate radius of the shell casings, and they're aiming in a more upward direction. That's, yes, that's consistent that's with that's what you That's consistent truth, yes. Thank you. Let me, let me ask you a little bit about some of the testing that you did or that you reviewed when you were coming to your conclusions. You mentioned something about um, the impact of these bullets downrange, and you said that they basically made clean holes or something like that, right? During my testing, all the impacts were circular. Okay. That means when there aren't any objects in the way, the bullet is not tumbling, it's not in yaw. Is that correct? That's correct. Are there weapons where when you fire them, even though there are no intervening obstacles, a bullet might still be in yaw or it might be tumbling? Yes, I mentioned that during direct. If the barrel is damaged or the rifling is missing or the barrel is corroded or intentionally altered, uh, you, would, you can see bullets that leave the muzzle in yaw, meaning they're not stable as they leave the muzzle. And that was one of the tests that I performed. I wanted to ensure that that rifle was shooting straight. And so sometimes just the design of the rifle or the condition of the rifle itself can cause a bullet to be in yaw, correct? Yes. Okay. So just because you see an, a wound that indicates a bullet is in yaw, that doesn't necessarily mean any intervening object had anything to do with that, correct? Correct. Okay. You mentioned something about point of aim versus point of impact. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, as I mentioned, the sights on that rifle can be changed, adjusted, and depending on the distance you're at. So say if you have it set for you know, 50 yards and you shoot a target at 300 yards, your point of aim is going to be different than where the bullet actually strikes. And it's also a common term when you have hunting rifles with scopes on them and you're sighting them in. That's what you're doing. You're changing, you're altering the optics so your point of aim matches your point of impact so you know what you're hitting when you shoot. And so that's what I was testing there is with the 300-yard sighting, where is it striking at 100 yards? And where is it striking at 100 yards? Well... These sights compensate for bullet drop, right? You shoot a bullet through the air, it's going to be affected by gravity and drop. So that's what that sight is for, is to compensate for that drop of bullet. So if your sight is set for 300 yards and you shoot at 100 yards, your bullet's going to be high because it's traveling up and then coming back down to meet your point of aim and point of impact. And that's what I saw when I did my testing, is shooting at a, a circle at 100 yards, the bullets were impacting high and that's, again, what I expected to see. And so at that distance, what was the difference between point of aim and point of impact? Well, it's going to be a little variable. It's my testing setup. It's not precision, but about a foot high is on average is what I was seeing. And so just so we know, that means if you're aiming with that weapon at an object at 100 yards away approximately, and you you aim at something that's two feet off of the ground, 
the bullet's going to land three feet off of the ground. Is that approximately correct? Assuming that you're aiming it properly, yeah. And it's a precise. And these these rifles aren't precise. They're battle rifles. They're not sniper rifles. So there's variability shot to shot on where the bullet impacts, even in a rest. But there's just going to be a difference between where you're aiming at versus where the shot lands. Yes. Okay. And at 100, 115 yards, the difference for this rifle was about a foot, right? Yeah, about a foot. I didn't map it out, but again, it was just uh, my main concern there was, was the bullet stable. And were you aware of the height of the entrance wound on the victim that was found in this case? I'd have to check the autopsy report, but the right flank would be several feet off the ground. Okay. And just approximately, if I said it was about four feet off the ground, would that sound more or less correct? Yes. Okay. And we're not doing a scientific test or anything okay. right now, but just approximately. So, and we have to start with some assumptions, right? Because we don't know where this person was or how this person was standing when they got shot. But let's assume that they're just standing upright, okay? And the shot comes in and it hits the person about four feet off the ground, that means that the point of aim was somewhere around three feet off the ground, correct? Could be, yes. At that distance, assuming that that distance is correct and the person is just standing, and right? aiming it perfectly, et cetera. Okay. And so somebody from 115 yards away, if they're aiming at a spot that's about three feet off the ground, they're aiming down. Is that fair to say? Yes, if they're standing upright. And that's another variable, too. You don't know how tall the person who's shooting is, correct? Right, if they're sitting or if they're prone or on a knee. So that. somebody who's very tall, standing up at that distance, is going to be aiming in a general downward direction, correct? Well, depends on how high the shoulder is off the ground, but yes. Okay. Well, I mean, if the person's six foot two or so, and they're holding it at their shoulder, that's generally a downward aim. Is that correct? Right, you can anticipate the shoulder being five feet off the ground, and if the bullet's impacting four feet off the ground, then you would have to aim downward. Okay. Right. Did you account for any of that when you, when you look through the Leica scan and the state's generally asking, is this possible? Is it possible that this shot came from this location and hit this person at this distance? Did you account for any of those variables? Well, I certainly account for them, and that's why... Um, my conclusions are consistent with and uh, not inconsistent with the shot coming from that area because I don't know the body's position, I don't know the shooter's position because I don't have any fixed points for which to measure. Okay, and so did you test different scenarios involving shooters of different heights, for example? No. And were you provided any information about how tall the shooter was in this case? Um, I might have, but I didn't consider it for what I was doing. Okay. But you agree you need that information to determine the light, the possibility of this shot coming from this location and hitting this person, correct? Um, I don't necessarily need the dimensions of the shooter just because there's so many different shooting positions. And also I didn't have a known position of the decedent either. So even if I would have considered that, I mean, all factors given, it's still consistent that the shot could have come. From that area. Well, I guess how do you know that that's even possible if you don't have these variables to consider? Well, I know that that bullet can travel 115 yards and penetrate a body, and if we don't know the position of either the victim or the shooter, um, I go back to what I know about that particular weapon platform and what it's capable of doing. But there are other variables that you have to consider, correct? For example, if there was like a, a 10 foot tall, really thick brick wall in between where the shooter was and where the victim was, you would say that's not consistent with what you're viewing on the ground. Is that right? Sure. Yeah, uh, maybe that was a poorly worded question, but you have to account for the fact that, that if there are intervening objects, it could be possible that those objects actually prevent a bullet from traveling that distance and getting to that person, correct? Yes. And the position of the person has a lot to do with that also, correct? The position of both parties has a lot to do with how that bullet 
gets to where it's going. And you don't know the position of either of the two parties, correct? That's correct. And you also weren't provided any information about any other potential shooters in the area, correct? No, there was no other ballistic evidence that suggested another firearm. I think I might have had some corroded um, pistol cartridges, but um, they were too old to have been involved. And when you say ballistic evidence, you're only talking about firearms, ammunition, shell casings, physical things. Is that and right? bullet defects on objects. That would okay. be the last component of that. You're not talking about witness statements, correct? Correct. So if there's a witness statement who says, I heard a shot and it came from somewhere over there, that's not evidence that you're considering in making that determination, correct? Primarily my analysis is based on objective data that I collect. Did you do a specific, let me pull this picture up real quick for you. This is Defense Exhibit KK. It's already been admitted, right? Mm -hmm. okay. This is Zumba, plus or minus. Plus or minus. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. And can you can you see that picture in front of you? Yes. Okay. Do you know what this is? Do you recognize this? I believe this is the potential line of sight between the house and where the victim was recovered. Correct. And so the, this photograph is taken essentially from, let's say, the view of the potential shooter, okay? And you can see it goes out there and you see all of those obstacles that are, that are in the way, correct? Yes. And do you know what all of those obstacles are? Obviously, there are trees. Do you know what some of these other things are? If I remember right, there was a storage box and some other random objects laying there. And when you say storage box, are you talking about that big square thing that we see in yes, the middle? The big, the big square thing. Okay, I just want to make sure we're looking at the right object. Do you know how high that object is? I would have to go back and look at the scan data to measure it, but I don't off the top of my head know. Did the scan data measure this and measure the height of this object? The scan data measures everything. Okay, and so it'll measure the, the thickness of those um, pillars, I suppose, right? Yeah, so what it does is it makes a point cloud, and every point is a measurable data point. So anything that it sees, I can measure up to probably like five millimeter accuracy. So once that scan is done, you can go back to anything in the scene and measure it. Okay. And I guess my question is, given these obstacles and given the known measurements that you have for these obstacles, given the fact that this weapon has to be aiming in a downward direction, assuming, and we're making assumptions, I understand that, assuming the shooter is a six foot and change tall person who's holding this rifle at his shoulder, Given the point of impact and the point of aim, he has to be aiming generally in a downward direction, correct? Based on the sights that were set on the rifle when I examined it, yes. That, correct. And there's that big object right there in the way, right? I'm not sure it's entirely in the way. I'd have to look at them. I mean, based on the perspective of this photo, it does definitely look like it's in the way. But when you look at the point cloud, it seems to be a little more um, line of sight available. It's hard to say, but it leaves there. But uh, yes, it's definitely something to consider as objects in the way of the, boy, of the bullet path. And so if I'm aiming in a downward direction and I hit that object, that object's going to stop a bullet, right? And it would leave evidence behind. Right. And there wasn't any such evidence that you observed, correct? Not that I saw in the documents. And same thing with those walls, the pillars of the pergola right there, right? Those pillars, those will stop a bullet, right? Should, yes. And if they don't, they'll leave evidence, right? Definitely they'll leave evidence. And obviously that big mesquite tree, the thick branches, the thick trunk, that'll either stop a bullet or leave evidence, right? Yes. Okay. And there wasn't any such evidence that you observed, right? Not that it was in the documents that I looked at. Okay.
let's talk a little bit about this, um, the tree branch, uh, because uh, you were t discussing the tree branch that was broken, correct? Yes. And in the point cloud, does it show the general um, relationship between that, the location of that tree branch and the location of the deceased person? It does. Okay. And is it fair to say that that tree branch is a little bit to the, is it south? South. A little bit to the south of the deceased person, and it's in between the person and the shell casings back at the house, correct? It is. And so just describe to me, so if you think, you think that that, the tree branch can cause yaw on the bullet, that was your testimony, correct? Yes. And a bullet like the one that you're describing is a bullet that can go through that tree branch, correct? It can. How much deflection is possible with this type of bullet if it impacts this tree branch? I didn't do any empirical testing on how much deflection, but based on other testing I've done, I mean, think of a tree branch as being round, right? So if it hits it straight on or perpendicular to it, it's going to affect it less. If it hits it at a glance, and I've seen that on windows, I've actually bounced bullets off of windows and not broken them because they've hit so lightly, but it's still enough of an impact to destabilize the bullet. So it would depend, is the short answer, on where it hits on the branch, how much deflection and yaw you would get. This branch was impacted at about two feet off the ground. Is that about right? Well, assuming it was impacted, <clears throat> yes. Okay, it, yeah, assuming that, and we don't know that. Right. But um, assuming that it was a bullet that strikes this branch, that's happening at about two feet off the ground, more or less, right? More or less. And it's a little bit closer to the house, so that might affect the point of aim difference. But two feet off the ground, you're going to have to be aiming at a spot lower than two feet off the ground with this rifle at that distance, correct? It would depend on the distance to the branch. I mean, the impact testing I was doing is at 100 yards, so this is closer than that. So, and there's an arc trajectory on the bullet. So it would, I would have to do some tests at that distance to see where you would have to aim because it's coming out and going up and doing bullet things. But yes, there would be some kind of point of aim, point of impact difference. Okay, and you don't know what that is? Correct. And so you don't know if that means that impacting at that tree from the distance is an aim that's higher than that tree or lower than that tree? Right. Okay, so we have no idea how the weapon is aimed if there's a bullet that hits that tree, yeah, if correct? It's, if it's a confirmed bullet defect. Okay, yes. and it's not a confirmed bullet defect, just to be clear, right? It is not. Okay, and do you know what sort of angle this bullet, let's say a bullet does hit that tree branch and it's gonna go up north where the deceased person is, right? It impacts at about two feet off the ground, this tree branch, but then it has to enter at about four feet off the ground. So do you know anything about the possibilities or probabilities of that happening? Well, I know it's possible um, because I've deflected bullets upward. And once a bullet's unstable, it can go any direction it wants. And uh, going back to my glass example, I mean, I was shooting relatively flat and that bullet deflected 30 degrees off the glass. And again, that's not apples to apples, really, and compared to mesquite branches, but the short answer is I would have to do some empirical testing to see what directions the defect or the deflection would happen. And I'm assuming that's probably impacted also by whether this bullet is already in yaw before it hits that branch, right? Yes. So if it's already in yaw, it, it could hit something else, and then it could be thrown even more off course. Is that right? It could. And the short answer is we, you don't know if this is really possible given the variables that we have on this scene because you haven't done empirical testing with these variables. Is that correct? Correct. Meaning mesquite wood is going to be different from another kind of wood and another kind of tree, right? There's definitely varying differences of hardness of wood, and that dramatically affects bullet impacts and what happens after they impact. And that's true even in the same species of tree, correct? 
I would think so. A tree that's maybe rotten or dying is going to be softer, let's say, than a tree that's, well, maybe it's not, I don't know, but that might make a difference, correct? It could. Okay. And there was some testing done of this tree branch to try to determine if it could be shown that a bullet actually impacted this tree branch. Is that right? Yes. And you didn't do that testing yourself, is that correct? I did not. But you reviewed the results of that, correct? I did. And specifically, the testing is looking for something that either contains lead residue or looks like a bullet hole. Is that correct? Yes. And in this case, there was nothing that appeared to be a bullet hole on this tree branch. Is that correct? Yes. And there was no lead residue collected from this tree branch either. Is that correct? There was no lead detected on the tree branch. So there's no indication that a bullet actually impacted this tree, correct? Correct. And were you also made aware that there was animal fur that was in or around this same area by this tree branch? I think I'd heard that, but I don't think it's in the report that I reviewed. Okay. If one of the detectives who first noticed the break in this branch says there's animal hair there, that's obviously another explanation as to how this branch got broken, correct? It's possible, yes. And there's no testing that was done on this branch to determine when the branch was broken either, right? Not that I know of. And I'm imagining that's a whole different area of expertise to determine the age of broken wood and things like that, right? That is out of my realm. Okay. Mine too, if you can believe it. So there's no evidence to suggest that a bullet actually hit this tree and broke this branch. That's correct, right? From the material reviewed, you're correct. Okay. Did you test, when you test fired this rifle, did you, or when you reviewed Aaron Brudnell's report on that, were you able to come to any conclusions about the grouping of the shots? With the cartridge cases? With the um, shots that you fired downrange. The, the impacts? No. So you don't know if they generally land close together or if they're very spread out? Well, with my testing, they were generally close together. I mean, they all hit um, a three foot by four foot panel at 100 yards. So, I mean, I know I was at least hitting that much area. Again, I wasn't going for accuracy, it was more stability and general. Um, impact of the sights versus the point of aim. Okay. So so all of the shots land, and you're sh firing in a stand, right? Yes. So the rifle is in a static position. It doesn't move, correct? Yes. So every shot is fired from the same exact position of the rifle, correct? In theory, yes. In theory, when you're testing. And I know it's not perfect. Right. But it's as close as you can get to holding the rifle in the same position and firing shots downrange. It is. And that gave you a result of a three or four foot, would you say, sort of area of impact for the shots? Probably less than that. Probably about a two foot. I mean, again, I didn't measure it. I was just trying to hit the paper. And, you know, again, that, that particular rest isn't as precision or as precise as I could probably get on how to hold that rifle. But, again, I was looking for different things. Could you just sort of show with your hands how big approximately mm -hmm. that area is? About that big? Okay, so all of the shots you fired landed in an area that's that size. Yeah, roughly. How many shots did you fire? Do you remember? Oh, to check my notes. Fifteen shots. Okay, so all of those fifteen shots landed in that area. Yes. In this case, you examined a body, right? No. Or you examined photographs of a body. Okay. Yes. That was not meant to be a trick. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and you saw one entry wound in that body. Is that correct? That was my opinion. There was one entry, one exit. There weren't any other bullet holes in that body, correct? Correct. And you didn't review witness statements, I know that, but there is a witness who states he was there just one step behind this person when this person gets shot. Um, assuming that the person who's firing the rifle, in this case, is firing at this person from 115 yards away, and assuming that person is holding the rifle steady and firing 
a bunch of shots in this direction, you would probably expect to see more bullet holes. Is that correct? Not necessarily. I uh, work a lot of officer-involved shootings of officers who are trained, very well trained to shoot, and they will empty two magazines, and I can find two bullet defects in the area they were shooting. So um, it doesn't surprise me that there were a lot of shots and not a lot of bullet holes or defects. Given the grouping of this rifle, um, and given, let's say, that the person is holding this rifle fairly straight and firing shots very rapidly, and given the grouping that you tested, under those circumstances, you would expect to see additional bullet impacts, correct? No, going back to my uh, previous example, I mean, officers, when they qualify, have to shoot their magazine in a, about an 8-inch circle to qualify. And I've seen, you know, again, lots of shots fired where the decedents hit one time. So, I mean, again, there's other factors to consider, but just the sheer accuracy of the firearm doesn't necessarily play into what I might see downrange. How about things that are around this person when the person gets shot? If there are, let's say, nine shots that are fired rapidly in this general direction, you're going to expect to see other things that are hit. Is that right? Yes, there would probably be some defects in some of the trees out there, but um, what they would look like, I don't know. I know that some of the trees in Washington that I've shot and tested, very subtle, the impacts to them, and I only know to look for them because I put them there. So I could understand why an investigation might miss some defects that were out, out in that large area. And if there are other animals in the area, for example, you might be concerned that the animal might get hit, right? Well, yeah, any time a firearm is fired, you expect that, you know, there's a level of danger to targets downrange. And same thing with other people, if other people are standing near the target, right? Yes. Okay. You said, according to taking a look at the entrance wound, that it's your opinion that that wound was caused by a bullet in yaw. Is that different from a tumbling bullet? No. It's the same thing? From, from terms of how it's going to affect a wound, it's the same thing. Are there degrees of yaw or tumbling? Definitely. Can you tell anything? And just to kind of narrow that down a little, if a bullet is somersaulting over and over like this, that's pretty extreme, right? Yes. And that's the word that you hear with a ricochet. Like in the movies, that's, that's what's causing that, is that bullet tumbling in over end. But it could just be that the bullet's getting a little bit off course as it goes further, correct? certainly can, yes. And we have high-speed video evidence of both of those conditions. And is, there's no way to tell from examining this wound what degree of interference this bullet had had before impact. Is that right? No, and that's something we could do with empirical testing. If a tumbling bullet would still penetrate travel through the body and still exit versus one that was simply just slightly unstable? How much energy is it going to expel into the body and still have enough energy to exit the back skin or the chest skin in this case and go down range? So again, that's, that's something that can be deciphered, but in this case, there's no way to tell from the entrance and exit wound if it was a tumbling bullet or one in yaw, but again, for all intents and purposes, it's the same. Okay, but the degree of energy that the bullet loses has an impact when it hits a target, for example, right? Um, yes, and going back to that 800-yard case, that was one of the factors that I considered was the bullet ricocheting off the water because there's a river there, and would it still have enough energy to go 800 yards and penetrate someone and kill them, and it didn't. So there is a, a level of instability that will affect the energy as it travels downrange. Okay. And we don't know what object or what was acting on the bullet that impacted this person. Is that correct? Correct. And that bullet was never found, obviously, right? As My far knowledge. as you know. Okay. And um, without finding that bullet, we can't tell which weapon was responsible for causing this wound. Is that correct? Right. If the bullet was recovered in microscopic comparisons to a particular firearm, it would be possible. 
And that's not possible in this case, right? Well, it's probably still out there somewhere, but not right now. Okay. And having that bullet, we would be able to determine whether that matched the weapon that you tested, correct? Yes. And whether it didn't match the weapon that you tested also? Yes. So that weapon could be excluded or ruled out depending on the results of the testing of that bullet, correct? It could be. And you say the bullet's probably still out there. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, it wasn't recovered. And so we have a through and through wound on a decedent. So in theory, that bullet is, you know, somewhere out there. That bullet couldn't have been destroyed on impact later with the ground or anything like that? Tell me a little bit about that. Well, um, AK-47 bullets, the 762 by 39 are steel jacketed with a copper coating. So you see a copper color on the bullets, but that's, they're not copper bullets like you would see in a pistol. That is copper coated steel jacket with a lead core. So pretty durable, pretty hardy, but also can be subjected to rust since they're steel. But um, you don't see any fragments really on the x-ray. So that bullet's really not coming apart. And so we would, some of the things we look for on these type of injuries is, is there pieces of lead in the wound tract to tell you the bullet's coming apart or fragmenting. I didn't see any of that on the x-ray. So um, I would anticipate the bullet is fairly intact wherever it is. That's assuming that this wound was caused by an AK-47 full metal jacketed bullet, correct? That's correct. But it's also true this wound could have been caused by a number of different types of bullets, correct? Yes. What are some of the types of bullets that could have also caused this wound? Well, it'd have to be a high energy, non-fragmenting bullet. And there's some other ones out there, but uh, typically speaking, um, this is consistent with the AK-47 round versus the type of energy, the lack of fragmentation that we see in this case. What types of weapons are consistent with the type of weapon that can fire the rounds that you just described? Well, the AK-47, the SKS rifle, which also shoots 7.62 by 39. Uh, there's, like I said earlier, a lot of other manufacturers chamber that cartridge in their firearms. And can you, I'm sorry, maybe I missed it. Did you say what other types of bullets could cause this wound? Well, it would have to be um, probably a full metal jacket ball ammo. If you had a hollow point or a soft point, you would see fragmentation in the wound tract. And so you would it need to be a full metal jacketed high energy bullet. How many types of full metal jacketed ball ammo ammunition exist? Well, just about any type of military round um, would have a full metal jacket. It's a con Geneva Convention requirement. So 308 Winchester, Seven, uh, the Russian round, the Russian sniper round. It'll come to me in a second. 7.54. And so there's some other different rifle cartridges out there that do have full metal jackets. You described the AK that you examined as a common type of rifle, right? Yes. To my knowledge, it's the most common rifle in the world. Okay. I just want to say what you meant by that, but you just answered that question. So that's the most common type of rifle in the world, the AK-47? Common platform, yes. Uh, most of the ones in the world are machine guns or full auto, and this is the civilian semi-automatic version of that. Okay. Would that then make that ammunition the most common type in the world as well? It could, yes. Okay. And so just to cut to the chase, there's no way to tell whether this wound that you examined was caused by the rifle that you tested, correct? That's correct. That's not something that we can prove scientifically, correct? At this time, correct. Okay. And you mentioned that this must have been a, a longer distance shot with a rifle. Explain what you mean by longer distance shot. Well, a close range shot would deposit gunshot residue from the gases onto the clothing and the wound. And those were tested and determined to be negative. You said the clothing was tested, correct? Yes. Do you remember if any testing was done of a backpack? I didn't see any of that in the documentation. OK. If a backpack were being worn by this person, that's close to the body, right? That's almost a form of clothing, correct? Yes. And that could be 
tested also to see if this shot possibly came from closer range, correct? It could be, but typically that testing is done around the wound area. So, um, but yes, any object or clothing item that person's wearing that's outer on the outside, we would probably look at. And if the wound is sort of here on the lower flank or back area, that's going to be near the backpack, correct? Yeah, like on this side. Right. So a backpack is going to be near that wound. Could be, yes. And so in order to do a full empirical test to see whether this was close range or further away, it would probably be a good idea to test that backpack too, right? Assuming they were wearing the backpack at the time, yes. Assuming that, right. Yeah. And to your knowledge, that wasn't done in this case, right? I saw no reports relative to a backpack test. When you say um, that there's, was it gunshot residue that you're able to see to determine if this was a closer range shot? Is, am, I, am I understanding that correctly? Yes. Okay. If you see gunshot residue on a person, or if you don't, how far away is the closest that a shot can be fired without leaving gunshot residue? It would depend on the firearm and ammunition type, and that's one of the common procedures that we do is a distance termination, meaning how far is the rifle away from the target where all that residue is dispersed and not deposited on the clothing. So you would have to do, again, empirical testing to determine that. But typically speaking, it's several feet um, before you do not detect any of that residue. So when you say a long-range shot from a rifle, what you generally mean is that shot came from several feet away or further. And impacted some kind of intervening object along that path. Could, it, could the clothing cause that yaw that you described, just hitting the clothing? Well, the clothing had the same type of defect. What about the backpack? Um, again, anything in, in that trajectory path could affect the um, bullet in its flight path. And any, okay, well, or it could have been fired from a weapon that has a, that shoots a bullet that has yaw, right? Yes. So there could be nothing in between the shooter and this person, right? But there could still be yaw, correct? Yes. Because the weapon being fired could be the kind of weapon that produces yaw, correct? Yes. And given that there's no gunshot residue or no, whatever you called it, I'm sorry, but... Yes. You, you could have somebody who's standing just several feet away firing a weapon and cause this wound that you're seeing, correct? Right. A good rule of thumb is about six feet or so before you don't see it, but I've seen, ex just like everything else in forensics, there's always an exception. So you would need to do the testing with the known firearm to determine that. So... This wound could have been caused by somebody standing six feet away with no intervening objects, correct? It's with possible. A, with a firearm producing yaw from the muzzle, yes. That's possible, okay. Do you know, you were talking about testing the clothing. Do you know how soon, or how, yeah, how soon that testing has to be done in order for that testing to be effective? Well, we're looking for heavy metals, and so they persist. Looking for antimony, lead, strontium. Barrier. So you can do that test pretty much yeah, those, how, how long on an Those metals object? stay there. Um, they're, they're, they don't degrade, say, like DNA does. So um, you can do that testing. I'm not sure. There probably is a timeline, but I know it's a, it's a pretty long one to be able to still detect those metals. And so the fact that that testing was done and there wasn't any gunshot residue discovered is a pretty strong indication that there wasn't any there, period. Correct? That would, yeah, that's consistent, yes. And the same is true for the tree branch, right? Right. The lead would persist. In fact, I have a, a pole in Seattle that I test every couple of years, and it still reacts, and the shooting was in 2009. So the so. fact that there's no lead residue on that tree branch is a pretty strong indication that there never was, right? I didn't examine the tree branch, but just based on what I reviewed, that is true, yes. Yeah, just a moment. What do you think? Just give us a moment, Your Honor.
just a real quick follow-up. Um, we talked about some assumptions that we're making and certain possibilities. And I just want to ask you straight up about certain things that you cannot prove in this case from the ballistic evidence that you reviewed. So number one, you can't prove who the shooter was, correct? That's correct. You can't prove which firearm caused this wound, is that correct? Caused the wound, correct. You can't prove which type of ammunition caused this wound, correct? That's true. Can't prove which bullet caused this wound, correct? Also true. Can't prove which direction the shot came from, correct? Correct. And we can't prove how far away this shot came from other than further than six feet away from this person, correct? Yes, it's true. That's all I have, Your Honor. Thank you. Redirect, Mr. Jetty. Denise, how are you doing? Hey, Rick. Hey. I'm going to leave off real quick. I mean, we'll start off what, where you just left off about proving. When we say the word prove, are we talking, you're, you're referring to you, forensic scientists, right? Yes. You live in a world of certainty, right? I do. Absolute certainty. I, I try. You try. I strive for that. So when you use the word prove, we're talking about, I mean, with absolute certainty, this is the weapon used to kill this victim, right? Yes. There's no way for us to have absolute certainty because we don't have the bullet, right? That's correct. But there's other evidence in this case, right? You've, you've been in crime scenes before, right? I've investigated crime scenes. Yeah, and there's other evidence that helps people out to determine what happened in that situation, right? Yes. Other than the weapon and other than the bullet, right? Objection leading. Stain. Let me ask you, I'm going to show you Government Exhibit 121. Remember that photo I showed you earlier? I do. And that's a picture of the property from an aerial view with the cones? Yeah, it's the top down of the porch area. And you see some... In the yellow thing, you see some cactuses to the to the right. The yellow circle. Yeah, like, like, like over five here? o'clock. Five o'clock on the yellow circle. Over here. Yeah, that one right there. You see okay. cactus, right? Yes. Right. The shell casings are found in the yellow circle, right? They are. All right, I just want to make sure we all understand the cactus. And let's just assume, if if I can just get right behind the. No, I can just do right here. I'm sorry. I can just do right here. If I can, I can put my pen right there. Let's just assume there's a potted cactus plant there, potted prickly pear. Assume that. Okay. Right? Would that interfere with necessarily with my line sight shooting in a horizontal way outward? A potted prickly pear. Um, it would depend on how those cartridge cases hit, but I mean there is a pretty decent pattern with all of them landing in the same general area. Okay. I'm like, can I get exhibit 35? And you saw the body orientation in this case, right? I did, face down. Face down. And you testified on cross. Did you see any bloodletting? There wasn't in, any in the photographs of the scene that there was a blood trail if you would. I mean, there's obviously bloodletting around the wound, but the, I didn't see anything, and there was nothing in the notes that I saw that there was any observed. And just for the jury's understanding, what was meant by bloodletting? Bleeding, dripping, pouring, depending on the, the size of the wound, and if a person's moving while they have a bloodletting event, there will be um, patterns to interpret. I'm going to show you Exhibit 35A, already admitted into evidence. You see, let me zoom out just a little bit. Did you get a chance to see that photograph at all? I did. 
Is that, do you see, in that photograph, do you see bloodletting or blood trails? Not from that photograph. I'm going to object, object on foundation. I don't know that the witness can testify to this subject. Well, I don't know if you heard his answer, but he said no. You want to strike the answer? Yes. All right, the answer is ordered stricken. Lack you, of foundation. Uh, the I'll question do, was, the question was whether he saw any bloodletting, and he said no. So. That's exactly the question and answer I wanted. Right. I mean, right. You're striking the answer, though? Yes, and the objection is foundation. I don't know that this witness can testify to well, what right, bloodletting is or whether he observed it. So foundation. Well, there's been a lot of questions asked about bloodletting. There were no <laughs> objections before. I'm going to reverse myself. The question was just a yes or no. Did he see it or not in the photograph? And he said no. So the answer stands. He testified on cross-examination that there's, you don't use trajectory rods with bodies? They're, it's still used, but it's not the common practice for trajectory rods and bodies. From my understanding is, and certainly in King County and Seattle area, that's not done. So if there's no trajectory rods here, in your, in your expert opinion, if there's no trajectory rods used by the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department, does that reflect upon their crime scene investigation? Objection foundation as to whether that reflects upon a crime scene investigation. Overruled, you can answer. I don't expect to see crime, for a crime scene investigation, I don't expect to see trajectory rods and bodies, and I would not use it to form my opinion anyway because of all the variables that I'm aware of for using that practice. And then we were talking about the um, entry wound and exit wound of the victim. Yes. The, I think we had like a, a visual, the entry wound in the right flank, you said? Yes. Right, and do you remember where the exit wound was located? Chest. Chest area? Yes. All right, so just explain to me as an expert, entry and exit, which direction is that bullet going? Back to front. Back to front. Any elevation? I think it was slightly upward, but again, there's variability in how a person can move. So um, that doesn't necessarily mean the bullet was traveling upward. Variability in the, how the person moves is one factor, right? Yes. Another factor, can the bullet yaw, continue to yaw in the body? Yes. Get 35. Did I take 35? Okay. Oh, I took 35. Let me ask you, as I'm looking for my, I think it's actually KK, Defense Exhibit KK. Let me ask you about, this is common, do you wear a backpack, ever wear a backpack? I have worn a backpack. Backpack goes on the back, right? It does. Backpack, does it, will it cover the sides of a person, typically? Typically, no, it depends on how big the straps are. And then when you're talking about the residue on clothing, you testified on cross about the residue on clothing, right? Yes. And when a, let's just use this example, when a bullet hits clothing, nothing interfering, I think your testimony was it's going to leave residue, right? Well, a bullet leaves residue as well as the gases leaving with the barrel. So the bullet will actually have lead on it from, that it picks up in the barrel, and then we call it bullet wipe. So when it strikes clothing, it will leave like a soot residue around the bullet hole, and that's if there's no intervening object and other things, you will see that. And I think all that was tested for, but you have to ask the other expert. Do you have any, in, in your report, in your review, was there any evidence of any bullet wipe residue in this, on the victim's clothing? Not during my review. Do you guys have your KK? Is it up here? Let me show you what's been marked as Defense KK. This is page two. Yeah, 
Remember testifying? Remember testifying about that image? Yes. You have no idea about where the photographer is standing or how high or how tall the photographer is taking that photo? I don't. I'm going to show you another one. This is the same photograph the government has. It's on state or defense exhibit KK. Same location of the photograph. Looking in the same direction. You see that one? Yes. This one's a little bit different, right? It is. In the background, you see that box in the, right in the middle. See that box? I do. Right. And you testified earlier, there's no evidence of any strike marks on that box, right? Not that I saw in the review of the crime scene documentation. And but right behind it, you see like a horizon, the landscape right there? I do. Do you know what the elevation level rise is from point of photography to that spot? Do you know what that is? I believe there's a creek bed, so it's uh, trending downward as it goes that direction, as it goes east. And uh, the scan data supported that. I'm talking about right at the... Right, you see right where this spot right there. Is that higher or lower than the, than the box? Oh, it's higher than the box. It's higher than the box. And do you know, if you know, do you know where the victim's body's found? Um, roughly in that direction. Let me ask you about left-handed, left-handed or right-handed. Do you know of any evidence that you reviewed that indicate any preference for a right-handed shooter or a left-handed shooter at all? In terms of the ejection pattern? No, did you review anything, any document, any piece of evidence that suggested anything about a right-handed or left-handed shooter? I can't recall. I, don't, I thought I might have heard something about that, but it wasn't anything I considered. And let's talk about the ejection pattern. You talked about, we did a little demo in the well, but we talked about if I had a horizontal shot straight ahead, straight ahead, right? My ejection pattern is going off to my right-hand side, right? Yes. Right. And if I angled my gun up a little bit, the barrel changes, but my, what do you guys call that? The, the ejection, ejection port. Injection port. I mean, it's still in the same general area. So would that significantly change my ejection pattern? Well, I would need to do testing, but I would not anticipate it would significantly change. But again, as I testified on cross, it is, there is a geometry change in that relative um, positioning. But is it going to be significant? I don't know. I'm going to show you Government Exhibit 121. And so when we talk about change, significant change or not, if I'm standing where the cones are at, horizontal, forward. The yellow is where the ejection pattern's at. If I were to rotate my gun up a little bit at a 35 degree angle, whatever, am I going to get a considerable change? I'll have some geometry change. I got that. But I'm going to have significant, will it be significant change? I don't think so. I've done similar testing with pistols um, with, um, you know, different orientations and I've not seen a significant change in where they ultimately land versus where the shooter is standing. I mean, there is some change, but not significant. But I mean, significant be up for argument. Well, I'm going to talk about that in a sec. But we're not talking about with a pistol where you go upright and then go gangster style. We're not talking about that with a rifle, are we? Right. All right. Let's talk about significant. We're not, if, if my angle is 35 degrees, we're not talking about a shooter standing over here, are we? I don't think so. We're not talking about a shooter standing all the way out here, are we? Again, I don't think so. I'd have to do empirical testing, but my experience, I would not anticipate that. And you, do you know that about the tree? What's your opinion about this tree branch in this case? Well, in terms of what? About is this, the, is, is this tree branch the cause of the yaw, in your opinion? There's no evidence that the tree branch was impacted by a bullet. Do you know why the Sheriff's Department collected the tree branch? I think it was photographed. That's probably my suggestion. I saw it in the photographs, and it's like, well, that might be a bullet defect. I knew there was an unstable, potentially, unstable bullet 
in play here, and I was looking for intermediate objects, and that was one photo of something that could have been an intermediate object. So it was collected and tested. And that, do you remember when that was, when you requested the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department to collect that? Not off the top of my head, probably slightly before they did their recovery. <laughs> I can look my, check my... Uh, can you just order. check real yeah. quick for me? I actually don't have it in my file when they collected it. I, I think it was uh, summer of 2023, uh, right after I think I visited and did the test firing. The summer of 2023? Yes. The incident happened January 30th of 2023, so months later, right? Yes. You saw in a photograph a broken tree branch. Yes. And you requested recovery of that tree branch. I did. Let's talk about, can we talk about clustering? We talked about that rifle being in a set position shooting, right? Yes. And even in a set position shooting, it still had some variation when it hit the target 115 yards away. With the bullet impact or the cartridge cases? Bullet impact, I'm sorry, thank you. Bullet impact. Yeah, the bullet impact does, there is some variation with that particular style. And again, it wasn't the preferred method of stand that I would normally use. So there was a little bit of variability there, but I got as best that I could with accuracy. And that stands kind of like a, I always think like a vice grip, grips that gun in place. Right. Doesn't gyrate, move. Correct. And guns like that, they have a kick, right? They have a, a, a recoil, right? There's a recoil. Right, and human factors play in. You shoot guns, right? I do. There's always a recoil factor with a, with a shooter, right? There is. And it changes based upon strength of the individual? It could. The age of the individual? <coughs> Possibly. The, if an individual's healthy or sick, right? There's lots of factors that could vary how that firearm is held shot to shot. And the biggest factor is whether or not they're a good aim or not, right? Ejection leading. Sustained. Does a shooter's precision ability impact clustering? How good a shot there, you mean? Yeah, how good it, a shot. It can. And you testified that you, you've seen officers who qualify. When, we, when I say qualify, you know what I'm referring to? I do. Explain to the jury what qualification means for a law enforcement officer. Well, it depends on the agency, but usually at least once a year. They have to fire their duty weapon on a course and shoot it at different distances and have a certain degree of accuracy to be able to carry their firearm. And so they have to hit a target and cluster that target, right? Yes. And to be a law enforcement officer, you've you got to be pretty good, right, to, to qualify? Yes. And you testified on cross that even with that kind of skill set, they still miss their target even at close ranges? Absolutely. Just one more second, Your Honor. I'm going to check with counsel real quick. And you testified that no bullet, no projectile was found, right? That I know of. I know of. Do you, do you know what efforts the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Department went to try to locate the projectile, the bullet? No. Let me ask your opinion and your expert opinion. Is the AK... Let me talk about the wolf. Let me talk about the wolf. Is the, the wolf bullet the most consistent round to cause the injury to the victim in this case? 
most consistent? It's definitely consistent with everything I know about that ammunition type and that weapon platform. And how about the use of the AK to cause that injury? I'm not sure what you mean by the use of an AK. Pretty consistent. We've got an injury, the distance, right? We have the severity of the injury. An AK can or cannot cause that injury? It can. I have just one more photo. Do you know what exhibit number that is? You gave me the photo. Just one second, Your Honor. Okay. I'm going to show you... Is it either A through M? It's one of the A through M. I'm going to show you. Can you put up? Suddenly, I'll identify it. Can you put it up? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. This is one of the thirty. One of the pictures in thirty-five State Exhibit thirty-five. You see, do you see where the victim's body is located, Rick? I do. Can you put a little circle around the victim's body? And have, you, have you seen this photo before? I think so, yes. Yeah, and what's in the background? Can you tell? A mesquite tree. And further behind that? Appears to be lights. Do you know, what's behind, do you know what the lights are coming from? Um, based on, I think, the orientation, that's the house? That's the house. Okay. No more questions, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Jetty. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, any questions from the jurors? Okay, let's... The question from the juror is, in your opinion, what direction would the victim fall if shot in relation to where you believe shots were fired from? Face up, excuse me, face down or face up? Okay. If, you, if, if you know. It's a good question. Opinion. It's uh, really hard to evaluate that. I've seen many videos of firearms incidents and people fall in a variety of ways. They usually fall in the direction and momentum that they're traveling in because they're focused on other things but if even if they're twisting at the time they could spin all the way around because they already started that twisting motion not that the bullets twisting them around it's just that they've started that action and also there's some um, nervous reactions that happen like involuntary jumps and things that occur so it's really hard to evaluate or predict where someone would fall after being struck even with a high energy bullet all right, thank you. So I'll give this question to the jurors. Council, let's get back on the headset once more.
you share with us so far. Today. Thanks, Ryan. I appreciate you making this place. Of course. All right. Um, I told you earlier that the lawyers did some work on their own last night, came in and this morning and told us about these stipulations that they had agreed to, and that made, it, um, that made it possible for us to get this witness in and complete his testimony and let him go back to where he came from. Um, talk to the lawyers. They tell me that the, the trial and the pace of the trial is going just consistent with what they anticipated. So we're on track. We're not uh, running behind or, or ahead of time. So given that, um, unless any of you have any objections, we're going to recess for the day and start back um, Tuesday morning at 8.30. No objection? This is your chance to make an objection. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, before you go, <clears throat> please remember the admonition of the court. It's again a long weekend, three-day weekend. Do not discuss this case with anyone. Do not uh, have any contact with the lawyers, defendants, witnesses, victims, or victims' representatives. Do not conduct any independent investigations. Do not use any form of communication, post blog, or post anything on the internet um, during the trial. Do everything you can to avoid, avoid media coverage. And with that, have a good weekend. We will see you Tuesday morning, next Tuesday morning at 8.30, and we'll begin the trial again, and we'll go Tuesday through Friday of next week. We're at recess. Thank you. We rise to court.